listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. Gonna slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, okay. Here we go. We are back at it again in the booth. The bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer and Liquid Death. Now, first things first. Stony Buds, how are we doing? So good, my dog. Always, always, always love hearing that. To my left, it's a real treat. We have KJ, Kevin Jones in the booth. Kevin, how are we doing today? So good, my dog. Oh, love that. <laughs> now, uh, for the people that are unfamiliar with KJ that have been living in a fucking cave for the past 48 years, uh, he's three times Rider of the Year, nine-time X Games medalist, countless incredible video parts, Countless magazine covers. He's in video games, and he was larger than life. Snowboard absolutely dominated, pure domination. Late nineties, early two thousands. If you don't know who he is, you're about to find out now. Uh, yeah, KJ, how do you feel about that? That word domination, just pure domination. Not really how I see myself, but <laughs> you know, it, 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 to be honest, it, it sounded pretty good coming for you, coming from you. You know, well, uh, no, that, there was no dominate. That domination was shared. Yeah. Well, from our perspective, you're you're one of the the marquee guys around that time. Now, I knew I know you grew up in um, NorCal, right? In the early days. Yes, sir. Now, who were the early influences? Because there's a lot of heavy hitters from the NorCal area. Yeah, uh, uh, influences definitely weren't hard to find uh, in in those parts, and and my influences were skateboarders. I started skateboarding in the fourth grade, and um my biggest influences like to answer the question quickly would be Noah Selaznick and John Cardiel. Um, I had the privilege of, yeah, you better heat that thing up, huh? <laughs> that might be a super. Yeah. Let's, let's that, give him a, a Cardiel Selaznick. Let's give him a yes. super. Okay. They deserved every second. Of that. A worthy super. <laughs> I mean, that's almost a new button. Um, yeah. So I had the, privilege of there was a skate park in sacramento called the grind and um i would be skating in the back there, there was a, a mini ramp here and there was a vert ramp here and then there's a whole street course in front there was a like a part partition is that what that's called yeah like a wall <laughs> there was a wall <laughs> don't use big words <laughs> um so you could literally hear when the boys showed up you know like it would kind of go quiet everybody would stop skating and you would literally hear Crack, crack, crack. Vroom, vroom. Big old vert wall on the street course. Crack, crack, crack. And you would just be like, whoa, they're here. They're here. You know, just like this kid, right? You're like, whoa. So you just go out and sit down and watch these dudes, you know, and they'd show up deep, you know, like Roach, um, Cardiel, Salaz, Aaron Vincent. Uh, then there's kind of the local dude snaggle and like there was like this group that showed up it was like the guys right so definitely early on was Salaz and Cardiel and then the short version is I saw the movie Riders on the Storm and who's in it Cardiel doing the sickest frontside three ever in the history of frontside threes in a spitfire shirt like with a flannel on right and at the end of his part in that movie, he does a backflip frontside 360. Like, he's destroying snowboarders, like, with style. Backside 180, grabs all Japan, just like. Because I thought snowboarding was, like, you have to understand that those movies back, there was people, like, in day glow suits. With, you guys want to, you guys talk about the resi around here? These dudes had mama socks on, dude. The resi went, we're talking, like, 90 liter resis. <laughs> It's a lot like, of volume. It's a like, large volume. I right mean, there. a large, large, extra large volume. And like their mamba sock went down like to their butt, you know? And so snowboarding wasn't very visually appealing to a, to a skateboarder. And it was kind of like, but it was like I was 25 minutes from the snow. And so that was the key moments when I saw those dudes. I had tried snowboarding and I was like, yeah, it's cool. Like whatever, but I'm going to go skate, you know? But. When I saw that movie, and I saw Salaz, and Salaz is in there, he's riding backward, he's doing like switch backside threes, and 
and just the way that he bunnies in the pal, he's like all in from turn to turn. I'm like that, wait a minute, that's it. And from uh, the day I literally, the day I saw that movie till now snowboarding's probably occupies eight hours of my thinking time and doing time during the course of the day, whether it's winter, whatever, but yeah, that's the beginning. Those, the, those two guys are the reason that I snowboard for sure. Yeah, that's incredible. When I think about uh, the the NorCal scene there, you think about I think about Cardiel and Roach and Slazing and, and like particularly Cardiel and Roach are kind of like that NorCal like fucking like let's get it, you know? It's like that kind of like nobody's soft. Like go fucking get some, go get some, or get the fuck out. And can you can you describe that like mentality of what that early days like NorCal vibe was? I got chills thinking about it. It see. Cause I got to watch this stuff live. Mm -hmm. It was n seriously no different. If you're a football player and uh, excuse me, if you're a, f uh, let's just say basketball player. Cause you guys throw the Michael Jordan in here all the time. Like if you're a basketball player and you're just show up at some court and Michael Jordan's there and just puts on a clinic, it is absolutely no different. That's that's where these guys stood in my brain. I wasn't into football. I wasn't into baseball. I was. It was skateboarders. Then all of a sudden, these dudes are snowboarding, and I and I live at the base of these mountains. It's like I don't know if those experiences happen for in other sports, you know. And then it, I then I got a pass a night pass of boreal, and I'm like, there they are. You're looking down the chairlift at Jurassic Park. Shout out to Jeff Tolan. They're right underneath you. Like, you can almost touch them. I can throw a snowball at them. I could spit on them if I wanted to. Like, they're tangible. Like, this sport was like, and you could hear them breathe in the air. You could hear their binding squeak. It was like, whoa, dude. Like, this is heavy. And that just, like, what you're talking about, that NorCal, like, like watch anything that Cardiel's ever done on a skateboard, and it's the same thing on a snowboard. He did. He's the one who did the first core... Uh, court cab nine he didn't land it he, he he like drug his arm and this was in like 95 he was trying these things and, I, and we're up at in, in an undisclosed location <laughs> in norcal and he's trying this trick and i'm like dude if he lands this it's seriously it was like what peter line was doing a few years later but he just never like put it down. And I was like, whoa, dude. So it changed my whole thinking. I guess I kind of overstepped my boundaries there a little bit because next thing I knew, I'm riding with these guys. I'm on the same team as Cardiel. Like that's how quickly that like this whole thing progressed. And I kind of got up, like, I pretty much hacked this whole story and I feel like I should start over, but I'm not. No, I think you did a great job with that. But one thing I got to ask, watching Kevolution, your intro, you're basically skating in your parking lot, it looks like in front of your house, and you're doing like 8 million tricks on flat ground. You know, all kinds of like flip tricks, no complies, all these things, right? And and all of a sudden, like, it, what, what I have to ask is you, you went from being like, you know, a, a recreational snowboarder trying to make it to being sponsored pretty quickly. And would you attest that? Like, are you a super obsessive person? Because that's what I kind of got from watching. Like, this dude seems like he gets obsessed and hooked. I was raised super religious. Um, not not in a bad way. Not not like I was chained to a pole. But that was just part of our lives. And, and there's a lot of really good qualities that come from that. And I understand that there's negatives that people see. But, and one of those things that, one of the byproducts of that was I was pretty structured in my, in who I hung out with, what I was allowed to do, what my curfews were. So what that bred in me was I had to learn how to entertain myself and which was fine. I didn't know any different. So I could, motivation is not hard for me to find. So from a very early age, I could take my skateboard when I found it, I was like, this is it. I didn't need anybody else. I didn't need to go to the park and, and have a 10 guys to play football with, or like, I could just go skate. I could grab my bass guitar and play and entertain myself from that gap between school and dinner time. 
like no problem. And the skateboard and music just filled that whole thing obsessively, like completely obsessed. Anything I get into is, it's almost a problem. It's like a blessing and a curse because it occupies all the space in my mind, what I'm into at that moment. And the curse part of it being that I can also get over it pretty easy. I can be like, it's not interesting anymore. I need a new, I need a new outlet. And that can be like, I need to ride a different, I need to ride a rail. I need to go to Alaska and ride powder. I need to start playing jazz music as opposed to rock. I need to play country. I need to, like my mind just like needs to be massaged with, and that's with, <laughs> with work and stuff too. I love uh, work in construction. I love parts of it, you know, like day in and day out kind of get old. But basically my, my deal is if I learn something every day, I'm stoked. Whether that's a trick, whether that's how to use a freaking drill in a different way. I mean, whatever it is in life. I mean, a lot of people that are successful in snowboarding are like that. Like the Travis Rices of the world, like that dude's obsessed, like focused and you know, and not have it blend into like this scatterbrain of like, you're too flighty and you're too like, you know, oh, squirrel, um, you know, borderline <laughs> like ADD. Um, if you can rein that obsession in and focus it, it's dangerous, you know, dangerous in a good way. So to answer your question, yeah, I'm very obsessive. Well, th that makes sense for the expedited track from from kind of recreational snowboarder to getting sponsored and, and let's just jump right into that. Cause I'm fascinated. You know, you, you had, you seem to have a, a list of sponsors that was pretty concrete throughout your whole career. But before we get into that, I want to know like the, the early sponsors who, who kind of helped you get your foot in the door and what that looked like. The early days was I was playing in a band and we were making money. So we would play jazz music at coffee shops and that was kind of our bread and butter. And that was a different band. And then I had my, my other band, Yukon Cornelius. And the beauty of this band is since I was making money, I could go out on school nights, right? I couldn't go to parties. I couldn't go to school dances, this kind of stuff. But I was making money and I would go into like the devil's freaking backyard. And I was a 17 year old kid going into bars where they had to escort us in. We would play our set and then we had to wait till three in the morning to get our two, two in the morning to get our gear out on a school night because we couldn't hang out in the bar. We weren't old enough. So I had this kind of lucrative thing going, this little like this little uh, loophole in the, in the parenting process. So I didn't want to lose that. Like that was like, and getting to the mountain and even getting to skate spots and stuff Four kids. My mom had her hands full. She wasn't going to just, and we lived pretty rural. So the skate spots were like you either had to hike a few miles or get a ride with your bros, which, didn't really go over too well with my parents. Not that they were super, I mean, I got to go. I just didn't get to go as much as I wanted. So I had this band that I didn't want to kind of jeopardize that. But this, the skateboarding was, if I wasn't doing that, I was doing the skateboarding. The snowboarding was, was becoming more of an obsession where I didn't, I couldn't stop it anymore. So I had my driver's license and I just, was like, I'm cutting school and going up snowboarding. That was my beginning of starting to get into a little bit of trouble as my youth was, it wasn't, I was out doing super bad stuff. I just wanted to go snowboarding. So, um, that morphed into moving to a place called Dutch flat once I was 18. And I had con snowboarding contracts that were, they were waiting until I was 18 because they didn't want to have my parents involved. They, you know, they didn't, so I'm like, yeah, let's just wait till I'm 18. I wasn't really in a huge hurry, but um, I knew I was moving out and I needed to have some money. So I moved up to this place, Dutch Flat, which is halfway between Boreal and Sacramento. So I could still get down to the shows. I could still do construction if I needed money. Uh, my dad does concrete. So another lucky bonus I've had in, in over the course of my life is I can drop in and, and work for a summer. I can work for a month and uh, you know, you got to make the best however you can. So I'm not afraid to, to go out there and do hard work in the summer 
in Sacramento. Holy and shit, it, concrete will make you appreciate any other job that you have if you're scrubbing concrete. It's yeah, I'm so blessed to have that in my arsenal. Um, that you're not afraid of a of a hard day's work, uh, it just carries over into snowboarding. And um, so the the band's going good, and and snowboarding's going good. So I'm getting I'm I'm having like this conflict in my mind. So a turn of events, my drummer in my band, um, R.I.P. He ends up getting some weird drug. He wasn't a druggie per se. I mean, he smoked his weed and, you know, he'd do some acid every once in a while, mushrooms or whatever, but he wasn't like the druggie guy. And he went out partying one night, got something weird and the dude died. And, and this, I was close with this guy. Like he, this was like my bandmate, you know? And I, I looked at my options at, you know, the grieving process lasted. And I looked at my options. I go, do you want to go down this road of, of music? What, what does that look like? Well, you got to have these people and drugs and alcohol and women and, and LA maybe. I'm like, I'm a mountain dude. Like I, I don't ever want to live in LA. So snowboarding it was, and I just put everything into that. I kind of put the music on, on, uh, not even hold. It just stopped and snowboarded every day I could. So you kind of had the band thing go, or you, you decided to change gears out of the band situation. And, and then, um, you just specifically, what were the, what were the brands that kind of helped you out in the early days? The brands that the first sponsor I had was, um, besides shops and stuff, was uh, Lamar, which was a rep writing situation from Lamar. So I I drove myself to a contest in Incline Village, and it was a pro contest. And somehow, I, I don't know how I got the spot. I, I have no idea. Maybe I won a, a little contest at Boreal, and, 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 the, and then that was like your segue to get into that. But it was a, a real, for back then, <laughs> a real contest. Uh, show, I show up, at the, I'm at the bottom, I'm like shaking, right? So you got Andy Hetzel, you got Sean Palmer, you got Jimmy Halipoff, you got like all these heavy hitters. Temple Cummins was even there, because I think they were doing a, like a Palmer photo shoot at the same time. And there was a bunch of other heads there. Um, and it was a big air contest. And I'm just like, holy crap. And there's a shot of, it's the time when Andy Hetzel goes down naked and the ski patrol tackle him. You're welcome, Hetz. Um, probably his proudest moment. <laughs> and you could smell these dudes in the, lift, in, the, in the lineup hitting this jump, right? Like just boozy. The cl- like just, and then Palmer, like, talk about an athlete dude like we can talk about him later like nothing but respect you might not like that guy but if you're winning x games medals in skiing and you're beating like world class you're beating like downhill you know how gnarly downhill skiing is and you're beating these dudes in a border cross and you're doing it on a snowboard and then you decide i want to ride a mountain bike and i'm going to dominate that sport I mean, Andy made a motocross main or supercross main event. Supercross, which is yeah. fucking the most mind blowing to me personally. But yeah, arguably one of the best athletes to walk this face of the earth. Yeah, I mean that's I don't I can't even fathom that. But long story long is I win that contest, and that's just kind of opened the door. Like, whoa, who is this kid? You know, and contests didn't mean like they were actually uncool back then. Like you didn't really. That, I mean, that's those guys showed up all drunk. I think Palmer got second. He was pissed. And then I had to spend all my prize money that I didn't have the money yet, but I had to spend that money in the bar. They just forced you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't have the money. I probably had 400 bucks in my bank account. 10%, yeah. the old 10% rule, mandatory. Oh, it's more, yeah. But yeah, it, was man- it wasn't even, a, it was just like, okay, we're going to the bar. I'm like, dude, I'm not even old enough to get in the bar. And I got to drive home. So I'm like buying these guys drinks. Like, uh, okay, uh, like nursing one beer for like, like, like if I get busted right now, I'm going to get, like I can't, I can't blow this, you know, like mm-hmm. just, I'm, I'm in awe of this. I couldn't believe I won this contest. So long story long is, uh, then Lamar and this rep, he repped for Lamar burning snow at the time was a clothing company. 
that's uh, I don't think they're have been around for a decade, if not longer. Um, and Arnett was making a real big push. So Arnett and Lamar were my first real sponsors. Bud, you got a good I Patreon? Got a, yeah, Patreon question for you from uh, Jimmy Doggerty. As a kid, I sold countless number of your Lamar Pro models. The Lamar gear was entry level, to be polite. How did those boards really ride? What's up, my brother? Um, they rode like a piece of plywood, and then you took, you know what's on every box? That plastic stuff, and then you throw it on the bottom of a board, and you kick the nose and tail up a little bit. <laughs> I seriously grabbed those boards, and I would take my truck, and I had a little cinder block technique where I'd put the cinder block here. They were so stiff that I put the cinder block on here, and then I had like one of those anti fatigue mats, you know, like they use at a restaurant. And I'd put that there, and then here, and I'd slowly back my truck up onto the board, cracking the wood, crack cracking the glue. <laughs> To make it, and I and I and I had it down to a science where I could like f- almost fully break the 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 nose, and then I'd turn it around, and I'd do the same thing to the tail. So it, you kind of end up with a with a super cambered board that's actually a reverse camber in a couple days. <laughs> so I might have invented the, the reverse. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you had to do a lot of maintenance, and then sometimes you would have to drill holes in between the bindings, and and I would put stickers over it, and then I'd sand, I'd sand the holes because they leave all the little screw things, and I'd put stickers on them to loosen up the middle part of the board. Because the, the, they did like an anti-top sheet for a while uh, at Taylor Dykema Factory in San Diego, and the consistency was zero. Like you would have one board, and you could, you could like get on a rail, and like the sides would come up. Like there was just no bend. Like there's no lock, right? And then you get another board, and it would just it was a noodle. So to answer your question, um, they were horrible. They were super crappy boards, but I'm so happy I got to learn on those boards. I got to ride those boards and figure out a way because I'm the least picky board guy there is because, I, be, I mean, I believe that if you, if, if you can ride, you're going to give Travis Rice any board in the world, and if the snow's good enough, he's going to ride it better than everybody. So, yeah, the board does a lot, but it doesn't do everything. You know, it's, if you can ride a snowboard, you can ride a crappy snowboard. So. I remember those boards back in the day. They were, they were pretty much tanks. Yeah, they remember were. Remember the first Lamars that came out with that crazy shape? Those the, were actually kind of dope. Those were before the, the whole Dykema, like the Rankwitz board was, was pretty good. And then he had the, one, the graphic that Mark Gonzalez did. Mm-hmm. That was one of the first boards I got for free, which was, you might need to mic rank with air horn there. Um, and then they got, then the, they did the anti-top sheet thing and it just went. And then. What's we, anti-top sheet? Is like a base on the top sheet? They just would um, sublimate the wood on top and oh, the glue okay. where they, they would cut the weight of just having the, the top sheet on there. And it just didn't work. I, I didn't get into like the ins and outs, but it, it yeah, it didn't. Uh it was really hard to get flex right and right isn't the right word uh, consistency was the right word like a board off the shelf wasn't what i was riding because i was running over it with my truck <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know <laughs> factory so. good I, technique. I made them work and they they eventually got better like by the end of the 90s they they actually did get a little bit better but and then the, the, at that time there was this thing called sandwich construction which they curved the top sheet over the sidewall which think the lord that it went away like that those were the worst like or the capped yeah capped construction. Yeah. yeah yeah i can't read is that I what i said i thought said I, sandwich. S- sandwich oh no sandwich. not sandwich yeah capped capped yeah, that's what i meant. an interesting era it's going to be great for all the warranty tech people that are going to get a snowboard that's too stiff and they're like calling the warranty people at these board companies and be like I, I was trying the kevin jones technique <laughs> I, I just backed up and ran over with my truck and it broke i don't know what like, can i get another board there's a bunch of eight <laughs> eight inch eighth of an inch holes in the top sheet like between their bindings like yeah i don't know i just uh, i heard kj does it i don't know i heard it worked good for him he dominated um but around well, this around this time too uh, i gotta get into you know when i look at like the older generation of pros and i think i experienced this as well and fucking throw me in that category but um, 
you know, there seemed to be a degree of mentorship with like the older generation and the younger generation. The only way for the kids to learn was like an older gen kind of had to show you the ropes. I, I feel as though, and and I know you did that for Eddie Wall. Did did you have did you have anybody that kind of like showed you the ropes around this time when you're getting on Lamar and things like that? First of all, I'm a little offended about this old guy comment. <laughs> old pros taking offense. I think you hit a nerve. Um, <laughs> Chris, Chris is currently one. I'm just getting. <laughs> Wait, he's getting up there. Oh yeah, he's yeah. There. Well, in my in my day, which is still going, by the way. 30 was the was the mark yes like you could see people's like their basket was just like 29 Twink. <laughs> like so for some reason some dude down in southern california got it in his brain that you can't be a pro snowboarder past 30 and what did kevin do tell me you know tell us tell our community we can't do something oh we can't mm -hmm. okay sure like prohibition yeah, it's you know a what I mean? you can't tell yeah. somebody you can't do something they're yeah. gonna go fucking twice as hard and i'm gonna make money doing it at the same time uh the mentor yeah that that's another thing that it it might not be dying i might not be there seeing it so it might not be dying it might still be there i just think that the mentorship these days might come from sources from people that might be not the best sources to get your mentorship from. When I say that, I'm talking about maybe you're getting your mentorship from your agent. You're getting, because everybody's got an agent now. Like, you go up on the chairlift to board, you're like, yeah, dude, I'm talking to my, you're like, you're snowboarding, dude. Like, I don't care. Really? You're talking to your agent on the chairlift? <sighs> That's a flex is what that is. That's, I don't even know what that is, dude. I'm just, yeah. Like, save your agent time. At least go in the cafeteria, you know. Go buy a fifteen dollar cheeseburger because you can afford it because you're entitled to that cheeseburger um <laughs> so it, it i don't so i'm not like really in touch with a lot of the snowboarding now there's different facets there's like the backcountry crew and there's like the, like the contest crew and maybe you know it, it depends on whatever avenue you want to go down like be really cautious of, of who's telling you what to do and what you should do that word should it's snowboarding. You shouldn't do, you should do what you want. I mean, um, mentorship when I was coming up came directly from skateboarding. It was a respect that you had for these people that have gone before you. Uh, I'll give you an example is, um, you went to a vert ramp. You didn't just drop in if you were younger, if you were three or four years younger than these dudes, it didn't care. It didn't matter how good you were. Those guys got to skate first. They told you when to drop in. And they would allow you to skate with them. And then you had to prove yourself. Or are you trying? It, was, it wasn't if you were good. Is are you trying? Are you going to run down to the bottom of the flat bottom and you're going to just start to pump? You're going to get away with doing that once. But then, then what's the next step? you got to stand up on the deck and drop into that ramp, right? So if you were trying, you had everybody behind you. If you weren't, you weren't going to skate. So it was take the slam, get the respect of the old dudes, and they'll let you in their circle. If you're, if you, if you're there just to hang out and, like, pump the flat, I mean, the worst thing you could do is, like, try to do a street trick on the flat bottom. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you were gone. And you didn't get too many tries. I mean, I've seen people's boards get thrown, and, you know, the, the, the classic one was you, they would t take a beer and dump it on your grip tape and go rub it in the dirt. I mean, it was pretty brutal. Like you, you had, there was the rules and you followed them, you know, it was like the skateboarding gang, you know, but you, the th you didn't want to screw up because you wanted to be in that so bad. So snowboarding was the same way. Like after a, that contest we were just talking about, um, I ended up being great friends with Jimmy Halipoff. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for, that was a quick, <laughs> um, and he, you know, he kind of brought me into a lot of the, the nuances and, and basically the ill parts of snowboarding. I mean, if, if you know Jimmy, you know that he he likes to air his grievances pretty publicly to anybody in the restaurant or the, the, the anywhere within a hundred yard range of where he's at. Love that guy. Um, so he kind of filled me in on how the industry works and, and how this, that, and the other. So my mentors were 
older people in snowboarding, older meaning what, they're four years older than you. And that continued throughout my career. It eventually turned into like a guy like Jim Rippey, who I, you know, with riding lines and, and like stuff where you could potentially die. Like that, you need to be mentored on that. Like, what do you do? Tom Burt, who, when he told me those couple words, these things, these people are going to give you this advice, but you got to earn it through your desire. You're that feeling that they get when you're around them. It's like, is this guy firing me up? Does he have it? Does he have that, that thing, that extra thing that you knew that you need, or is he just going to be some guys up here for the scene? And all that stuff is super transparent. You can't fake it. The infectious juice, the, the infectious juice. And that, that went on for, um, Mike McIntyre from MacDog, really good example of somebody who mentors everybody, you know, everybody he's come in contact with. My biggest mentor of all time has been the Hatchet Brothers for life, for, for anything I'm going through. Like Mike and Dave would carry me out on their back in the backcountry. Like the relationship I had with those guys is like, and here's what you do. If, here's how you test the slope. Here's, how, here's where you hike up. Here's how you use an analog, you know, an old beacon that, you know, the ones that you had to turn the dial. Here's, we're going to spend time on this. This is important. This is life or death. This is how you get in and out of a freaking helicopter. This is how I'm going to shoot it. This is, this is what time we wake up. We're not late. We're never late. I've seen the dude drive out of a trailhead, leaving dudes at the trailhead. Like, well, I'm going to miss the pink light, dude. You guys are screwing me. There's just things you pick up, things you learn that you, you may think you know how this, production works or how how you're supposed to be as a snowboarder but it's it's not what you think it's very there's a lot of things attached to it and you learn every day you're out there and the old the guys that have been there are the guys that you need to be learning from we never had a thing against skiers because skiers knew where all the spots were around tahoe and alpine and and they, the telemark ski, they, they've all been out there. How do we get there? Well, I don't want to waste a powder day. Like, so the skiers were like part of our whole group. You know, they were. What was the uh, bit of advice that Tom Burt gave you? Um, we were, I was filming with the hatchets. So the first time I went out with Tom Burt and Salaz was there. And, and we were in between Alpine Meadows and Squaw Valley, a place called White Wolf. And. And I'm, I'm just this kid. I'm all fired up. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get some powder lines for my jump. And I'm all, you know, obsessed with my part and, like, just so happy to be here. I'm like, Eddie walling out, like, oh, mm, uh, mm, uh. and, and <laughs> so I, I come in hot to this line and I just throw a heel turn and blind myself. And I'm, you know, getting the snow out of my face, you know, why, like that ever works, you know, you're, but for some reason your arms just go like this. I don't know why to try to get the powder plume out of your face so you can continue ripping your line. And I hike back up to the top and Tom Burt just looks at me and I didn't, this is probably the first time I'd met the guy. And he just says, Hey, Kevin, do two turns where you think you should do one. Just the simplest piece of advice has stayed with me. Pretty much every line I've ever ridden since that goes on my brain is like, don't blind yourself. On the first turn do two simple advice that just probably saved me from <laughs> you at least see every kid doing that too right i did that first <laughs> first line Everybody i ever dropped in it. on i remember doing the same fucking thing and even if you're not filming you yeah. do it to yourself all the time it's like throwing so a blindfold on in the middle of a fucking yeah. line you're like yeah. oh jesus what the hell what? oh god i've never yeah. heard anyone actually break it down into do two turns instead of one that's amazing Basically, yes. Yeah, so true. Mm-hmm. Well, because you don't want to, you don't want to come in sliding a turn. You want to come in hot, so it looks good. You know, riding a line and filming a line is two different things. Yeah, true. So you come in. You don't want to just be coming in side slip and looking on your heel edge. You know, you got to be doing the salazzy little hoppies. Mm-hmm. You know, do a couple turns into it and then let the speed get you. You know, perfect advice. I mean, and so simple, but these. That thing has stayed with me, you know? That's mentorship. That's like, that's something that if you're an up-and-coming kid, pay attention to what the old guys 
have to say because they, they're only telling you that because they've been there. I like also what you're saying about I was Eddie Wallen out and uh, and sp- I was like all fucking amped and and there's that you know I I call it the juice but there's that that young infectious energy that that certain you know you bring a younger kid around in the crew and you they fucking chucking and they're amped and they're fucking let they're excited you know you've been to Japan fucking ten times but it's their first time and they're fucking losing their <laughs> shit and you're like oh yeah. this is awesome I'm not have to be a salty old guy anymore mm-hmm. and so you know like. That that's that's great advice too. Just because you you know you were that kid, and then it seems like you kind of did that for Eddie. And I don't know, it's just it's kind of cool. Yeah, Eddie, full on. He just had that what you call the juice. He just I could tell he was on a K two board right around Mammoth Labs. Dude was up there from bell to bell every day. He'd be like hiking a mailbox over in the. I'm like that dude's like me. Like he'll just like go hike a mailbox by himself. Like he wanted it like just and just slamming and like it's I'm like, dude, it's snowing. What are you doing? Hiking a mailbox in the park, like, write some powder, you know, like, what? like you just, and then you, I'm walking out, you know, I'm coming home from the bar, you know, whatever shred all day. I'm walking down from the bar one night and the dudes, he's sweeping the, the lodge. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, Oh, I work here. And, I'm, and I kind of was like, I kind of felt like a jerk because I was kind of like, well, what do you, did you spill something? You know, I, I didn't put two and two together that this dude was the janitor at the lodge. And I'm like, Hey dude, I'll pick you up tomorrow. Let's go shred. You know? And, and he's, oh, e- oh, e- oh, e- oh, oh, you know, Eddie, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> freaking the most awesome guy. I mean, I couldn't have picked a better dude to like, to uh, put, put a little energy into it. You know, like he just, it didn't take much with him because he already had it, you know. Then we put him on Genius and and uh, yeah, the rest of he, you know, the rest was all Eddie. Well, I got a great guest question from good old fashioned Eddie Wall. Here we go. No kidding. Yo, Tools, Eddie here. Uh, my question for you is: In the early two thousands, when we were riding a lot together, you were able to free ride at the highest level and then go hit backcountry kickers, then you know, go to the X Games, win the X Games, hitting massive park jumps, and then also film street rails uh, with the very best. So uh, to say you were a diverse rider is almost an understatement. Um, what do you think about riders nowadays being extremely specific and not necessarily being as diverse? Is that something they have to do uh, in order to stay at the top? Or is that kind of an excuse and you think that they should be more diverse? Uh, miss you and uh, looking forward to riding this season, buddy. All right, later. Tools, Eddie. He's uh, he's he's kind of <laughs> prying for a little shotgun, isn't he? Um, <laughs> Tools, super good to hear your voice, and it was like you were right there because you're in this uh, my headphones. Thanks for the uh, the compliments there. I never set out to be a, this huge, diverse snowboarder. It was just what the conditions allowed. And, and the guys that that I look up to did it all. They skateboarded when the snow was crappy. They had a rail in their backyard. They they would set up a little quarter pipe and do an invert on it. You know, Salaz and those guys. And um, If the snow's not good, you go ride rails. If the snow's good, you're riding powder. It wasn't it wasn't a choice. It was just like, if you want to go shred that day, you went and rode what was there. It snowed in town. You saw a rail, you went and shredded that. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't that I set out to be well-rounded. I just liked to snowboard every day. And this obsessive part of my brain, like I wanted to, um, ride rails like JP Walker. I wanted to JP and Jeremy, I wanted to be part of that crew. I wanted to be part of the crew that was that was reconning in Alaska and 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 figuring out the the heli ski scene. I wanted to be see what the contest scene was all about because that's where the biskies was. You know, these if you do the contest, that allows you to go on some trips to Alaska, which were super expensive, and you always had to use a lot of your own money. Like the myth is that everything's always paid for. Um, you had to want that, you know, especially back then. Like, oh, you want 60 grand to go to Alaska? I'm like, really? Yeah, we can't afford that. So I wanted to be part of it all. I, I wasn't content with just like 
being a jump guy. I wanted to know how to jump like Peter Line. I wanted like all my idols, all the guys I looked up to, I wanted to be like them no matter what genre they were focusing on. And it wasn't a mental thing. It wasn't a I'm going to be a, a well-rounded snowboarder. I just wanted to snowboard like these guys. And my peers, I wanted to I wanted to be part of it all. And that's that's all that is. Um I think the these days um I I kind of struggle with this. I mean, there, there's more people in the pot for sure. There's more people. There's there's soccer moms out there that are that are putting their kids into snowboarding at a young age and, and pushing them because there's money. There's a, you can make a career out of it now. It's got it's got the okay, you know. Okay, you can be a snowboarder now. It's we in the, it's in the Olympics. It's a we yeah a little tip. You can go ahead. Yeah, now. the Jimmy. second it joins the Olympics, it's on. Is it easier or harder? I, I don't. That, that's such a big question. I'm just going to be a rail guy. Cool. If that's what you want to do, great. But you're missing out on take some of that rail money and go to Alaska once. At least experience that while you have the time and the money and before life kicks you in the balls and you're not allowed to take a month off, a month and a half off from normal life, this grind that 99.9999 people have to live with. Take some, <laughs> take some time for yourself and go up and experience other parts of snowboarding. Instead of sitting there and, and maybe even worse is talking smack about those those other people that are in your community. These are your friends, your bros, or talk smack about them, but do it in a way that's light and make sure and talk smack about yourself. But take these opportunities and go snowboarding. I mean, oh, it's snowing. I can't go hit the park jump. Instead of, you know, don't go get wasted that night. Go Get up early, stand in line, feel what it likes to have that vibe in the lift line. When, and why are all these powder geeks? Why do they wake up at four a.m.? I want to figure out what that is. Don't you? Like the vibe in a lift line when it's, it's just like, ah, like people are like, it's the, weird. The first chair vibe. Oh man, it's weird. I mean, it's I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll go get on my splitboard and go get one run. Why those guys fight for lines that you've skied a hundred times, but. Um, don't you want to feel what that's like? Is, isn't, isn't that part of snowboarding to you? If it's not great, but, uh, well, you know, my advice would be check it out. Well, we, we talked about this in the Patreon interview, but for those who aren't Patreon, uh, members, we asked you the worst trend in snowboarding and in life. And, uh, I just thought you had a fantastic answer. So you want to just kind of fire that up again? It's kind of like when you land a trick once, you know, like on your first try, like say you, you get like some trick on a rail and it's the trick you wanted the filmer missed it well you <laughs> that's what it's like this is what the filmer missed it well that, that's not what i'm going but yeah that's e that's even better no it was like oh i'm gonna get this second trick that's in your mind is easier but then you just end up like ragdolling down the stairs 15 times <laughs> but you did the trick you wanted on your first try you should have just sat back and you know um uh, the two, the worst trend in snowboarding is kind of a multi tiered, well, not tiered, multi, it, it's, it's a big old spaghetti it's a meat. bowl. It, it, yeah. Bowl of spaghetti. And there's a couple of meatballs in there. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, entitlement, you know, that, that this, this idea that you're entitled to a career or money or, or I'm not getting mine mentality that I, that I hear a lot. I, I just, I don't really, I don't like that. Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, it's a blessing that you, you woke up in the morning. It's, it's th this world in general doesn't owe you anything and snowboarding especially doesn't owe you anything. If you're getting paid to ride a snowboard, you, you're already way above the curve or if you're not getting paid and you get to snowboard every day if you got your life figured out where you you live in a garage like i did for a long time or you got your life figured out to where you can be in the mountains you know most days of the of the week you're already winning pat yourself on the back i guess give your give yourself more credit than wasting your energy bitching about an industry that's the industry doesn't love you. The industry isn't snowboarding. You're snowboarding. And wherever you want that to go is you. So this idea of being entitled to getting some sort of monetary 
or your idea of where that should be and expressing that like especially in public forums i I don't i don't like that it makes my butt itch so to speak (laughs) um because there's a lot of there's a lot of people that came before you there's a lot of shoulders you're standing on there's a lot of shoulders i stood on um and i'm not even saying that i was the greatest at it but um and now that it's an olympic sport and all this stuff there's there's this whole side of it that's more about how much money you make or and that that shouldn't matter as much as as i think that that it's getting. And I get it. It's like the national choir. Everybody wants to know how much money you make, but that makes it like acting in freaking NFL. Like, Oh, freaking everybody will always want to know about the million dollar contract. Kevin Jones had I like, screw you. I don't, that's my business. I don't, you don't need to know about what, you know, or, well, he gets paid too much. Like who, who cares what your bro makes? Go get yours. Be compared about your, what your own program is and run it and run it hard. And run it till you don't have, if that's what you want to do, run it till your boots fall off, you know? Die with your boots on if you have to. If that's what you want, go out and freaking grab it. Don't waste your energy complaining about it. So I see a lot of that happening, which is, I don't know, entitlement. And I've had it. I mean, it's not, it's, it's human nature to compare yourself with other people. And I don't think this day and age you need to do that. I think, especially with Instagram, with all these other things, you can be you, you know? Go be you. Go do you. And then it's all on you. Then all the fault is on you. There's nobody to blame if you don't get your deal. Maybe you're not a guy that that um, knows how to get a deal. Well, now there's agents and stuff. You got, you got every opportunity in snowboarding right now that people before you didn't have that they made for you. So give a little, you know, mm-hmm. be stoked on where you're at, I guess. Is, and there's a lot of that going on too. I'm not saying that snowboarding is going in a bad direction. Snowboarding is going in an awesome direction. Just don't be the entitled guy. And if you put the time in and you're actually good at snowboarding, the rest is probably going to fall into place. It, you know? And it definitely will. Yeah. There's not, you know, especially this day and age, it's always like, for lack of a better example, is who's the next Sean White? It's like, well, there's never going to be another Sean White. Why does there have to be? Who who wants to fill those shoes? I don't. I don't want to, What are you going to have to do? Like a quad McMillian cork 45 feet out of the pipe to Down be the right ne- unsafe is what that is yeah unsafe. like is that do you even want to be the next do you want to find the next sean white like whoa well <laughs> i, I want to kind of lean Dude, into something heavy. something here because what you're talking about super interesting you know um what you're talking about like what what, what as a young maybe aspiring snowboarder you're kind of chasing if you really dissect it and you want to get on a deeper level you know you you want some you want some bisque right you want some money you probably want some fame and, and attention, right? You, you, subconsciously, like, fuck, you want to be rich and famous, dude. Like, they be in, it's a fucking, it's got a glamorous lifestyle. And snowboard famous isn't really fucking famous for the record. But you want to be, like, semi, like, people know who you are. You want respect and clout. And, and you can trick yourself into things like that. But I think that's that's a motive for a lot of people. Now, being somebody like yourself that has achieved the peak fame, the peak, you know, in the in the biggest years of snowboarding, um, you know, what would you say just to kind of like, just precursor people that are going down that road, what, like what it is when you actually achieve that fame and what it does to a person. Okay. To kind of finish that last question was with the entitlement is the community, right? Snowboarding is a community. And when I, and when I seem a little harsh about entitlement or sponsors or, or this thing that you're seeking, which it's multifaceted. It is. It's the fame. It's the money. It's the, you know, maybe some people it's women or, or rub elbows with the elites or whatever that is. I feel that that's t- that takes, there's a, there's a strong community in snowboarding. And, and it's, I'm very passionate about the people and the help and that you got a bad, you got a bad thing going on. Well, I'm doing good. I'll help you out. You know, the, not financially or just making a phone call, texting, you know, I'm having a bad day. I can text somebody and be like, Hey dude, like shit's crazy. Um, so that community is, is, is what I've learned over the years is important. It's not about my video part. It's not about this. It's the people that make this whole thing happen. That being said, to answer that question was what is every, you ask any teenager, what do they want? 
And the new one that I that I've been hearing, like you go to the skate park or something, like you just ask some random kid, like, "What do you, you know?" You start talking to him, "What do you want?" Or your kids or whatever. It's like, I want to be famous. Like, oh, do you? And I heard, I want to be Instagram famous. I'm like, what the, heck? what does that even mean? What is Instagram famous? Well, you know, well, it's like that South Park episode where it's like, well, it's Paris Hilton, and the guy got and the what's the little chubby dude's name? Uh, Cartman. Cartman says. Well, she's famous. And the other dude's like, well, what, what does she do? I don't know. She's famous. But I know, but what does she do? It's, it's like, she's just famous, right? Like, what, is, what does she do? <laughs> she has a cooking show. Like, I don't, she melts like marshmallows from the Lucky Charms. Um, yes, I, I watched it. <laughs> um, no, so kids, I mean, they, they want to be famous and they want to have money, right? Well, I'm here to tell you from experience with both that it, it's a fallacy. It's a lie. The idea of it is great. The journey for it is great. It's, but once you get there, then what do you got? You have to have a game plan for after that, or you're going to have this big old empty hole in your brain going, okay, I did it. What now? I'm famous and I don't like it. It was cool for a year. I got three houses. I got like a money guy and what do I do now? I'll go to the grocery store. No, I don't want to talk to that dude. I wonder if that guy's working. That, that always talks my ear off. Like, you got to have some sort of idea that, that this thing, whether it's rock and roll, whether it's, it's a complete fallacy, which reminds me of a quote that Shep Gordon, who, for those of you who don't know him, I didn't know who he was, but I got this quote from him six or seven years ago, I ran into it. I, I forget where I think that he, that he made a, um, a movie or maybe I just stumbled upon a, on the internet or something. I don't really know, but the quote basically says that, that fame has no intrinsic value unto itself. And the, the love of fame and money. And if we can pull that quote up, I'd love I have it, it right here. So okay. it says, there's nothing about fame that I've ever seen that's healthy. It is something that is very hard to survive and has no intrinsic value unto itself. It gives me chills. And you're talking about a guy who's rubbed elbows with lots of famous actors and musicians, and he uses the word nothing. Nothing about it is healthy. He didn't sit down and just write that off the top of his brain. He probably sat there and looked at it and said, I'm, I'm going to shed light on, on what." everybody wants it's like whoa the you like people want to be rich and they want to be famous but this dude who's been around it for the most of his life around the richest and the famous is telling us there's nothing healthy about it why feeds the ego heavy so you got to kind of have some sort of like whoa moment i got rich and famous no, didn't like it is that okay? Is it okay to say that? Oh, what an asshole. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's that what I thought, which I didn't even start. Snowboarding wasn't at a point where you could be that in the beginning. I accumulated all these responsibilities. Now you can look at a career and you can go, okay, well, you got to do this and you got to do this. And, some, and you can probably write it on a piece of paper and some agent will tell you, like, this is what you got to do and you'll make this and this is what it is. We didn't have that. It was all, oh, we're going to Alaska. We're going to find some new place to put a helicopter and where do we put the gas tank? You know? Or we're going to waste a whole tank of snowmobile gas just to find a snowboard jump somewhere in the Tahoe backcountry that Slaz hasn't find. Good luck. You could probably need two tanks. Um, so these responsibilities for me just kept coming and all these opportunities. And, and in my brain, I'm like, you can't blow it. You know, you got action figures, and video games. And, but with all that, all this time and energy, What's it taken away from? It's taken away from snowboarding. It's taken away from a powder day with your bros or going skateboarding in the summertime. Like there wasn't a summer. There wasn't, there, there was 10 years where there was not, there was, it was work. Like, and I just remember sitting back going, I didn't sign up for this to work this hard and to be this stressed out and to get a phone call at nine o'clock at night that you got to go to Japan the next morning. And for the listeners, you might 
oh, and you're, you're probably thinking, who's entitled now? You know, but after your 20th time going, it does become a job. And it's like, do you want a job? Do you want to, do you, a job is fine, but do you want to be that stressed out? And it's, and you're just setting yourself up for a mental breakdown, basically. So long story long is make sure you want fame and money. Do some research on it, you know, make sure that, or how much you want. I think there's something to add there too, because you can almost fill that in for, um, like once you have blank, then you are happy. That kind of like that way of thinking. Once I have the girlfriend, once I have the money, once I have the fame, like you, you could kind of go down a list of, of, pretty much a lot of the things that are sought after and that entire way of thinking I think is also completely broken like once I filmed the video part one you could you could go on forever right so that's like just something I wanted to just was going through my head as you were talking but um and you can add some to this too but I kind of wanted to change gears into do you have anything else to add on that oh just as cliche as it sounds it's the journey man it's the it's the memories you make it it, uh, buying a house I thought oh I'll be happy I bought a house bought a house when I was 21 then, then what? Oh, you got to buy another one. You know, then it's a never ending cycle. It's a rat race. Mm-hmm. And if you can wrap your mind around that and enjoy, it's so cliche, enjoy the journey. Yeah. That's what it's all about. The, the mem- what it's all about. The memories are all you're going to have left in the, in the end anyway. When you guys didn't become pro snowboarders to become rich and famous at first, when you first started, right? Um, I mean, I don't, I think, I think it was, well, it was a love for, for snowboarding. You, when he started, there wasn't, didn't really exist. Yeah. Probably. No, the, well, when I look at it, when I really, when I really actually analyze it, I think it was because I wanted to film like the best video part, right? Or what, whatever. I wanted to do the best tricks or all those things, right? And, and, and when you really look at that, that is a form of attention. That is, hey, look at me, check me out, validate me. So I think there, you know, when you kind of like analyze it from a deeper standpoint, there's probably, that is a little bit of a fame chase, you know, when you look at it honestly. So, Absolutely. You know, there, like, there's no question about that. And, and I'm not trying to sound like a purist or some Zen master. Like, absolutely, it pushes your, your buttons in your brain. You love getting those accolades. You loved showing up at the premiere and your part was first, even as nervous as that would make you. I mean, that's actually what you're seeking. Mm-hmm. That's those ego hits mm-hmm. that you're getting. But it's also like, yeah, cool. I mean, that was a goal of mine for so long to get at that, that video part, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. that goal's done okay the next one mm-hmm. it's never oh it's never over it's like the clip addicts you but know 100 percent. but the the best part i think too when you look at that that's probably the unhealthy part of it the ego stroke the fucking fame the validation the things that go to your head and make you become a douchebag until life kicks you in the nutsack but um what what is beautiful about that is like if you take what's good about that the obsessiveness of like fuck like that addiction that i need to get that back lip on that rail tomorrow like I would rather fucking make it or go home in a hospital or end up in the hospital. Like that's the only thing that matters or whatever that type of obsession and, and like really bringing the best out in yourself is the beauty is the kind of inverse good side of that. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And that's, that's the quest. What am I, I think it's healthy to say, how do I measure up with these guys? How do I measure up and how am I going to continue the legacy? How is the torch going to be? And that can be, I'm just going to have more fun than everybody. That's fine too. Mm -hmm. I, it doesn't have to be like some pro, like, you know, okay, this guy did this trick on this rail. I got to do a different one and a harder one, mm-hmm. but that that's part of it too. We'd be lying to say that that's not part of it. The well, accolades. hundred percent. Also what you also talked about too is comparison and there's healthy comparison and unhealthy comparison. I love this topic because you have, you have unhealthy comparison is l- looking at somebody on Instagram or something and saying, Oh my God, they have this contract and I don't, this person's sponsored, but I'm better than them. Like, why, why can't I, why don't I have what they have? They, why don't I have what they have? Or that's unhealthy comparison. This person, and a lot of times it turns into hate, which comes from jealousy or envy, or if you're, if you're going to acknowledge where those emotions come from. Healthy comparison, on the other hand, when I look at, take somebody like Louis Paradis, right? Pro snowboarder guy I look up to in the, in the streets. He's pretty much my, my current favorite snowboarder in the streets, one of them. And I can compare myself and I can say, all right, I'm concerned with this person that's that's like, let's say I see my mind going down a rabbit hole. Oh, this person has a bigger contract than I do, or this person has this, did this better trick than I did. You you can flip it and say, well, what would Louis Parody be doing right now? 
what would Lou, what would Big Lou be doing right now? Well, Big Lou wouldn't be thinking about this because he's practicing on a rail or thinking about finding a spot or he's focusing on his project. What would Lewif be doing right now? That's a good comparison. Like that's those are people that you can compare yourself in a good way. Oh well, Lewif wouldn't be doing this because he's fucking actually out hitting a handrail right now, or, <laughs> right? Right. And so like right. that that is healthy comparison versus unhealthy comparison. But yeah, I don't know, just random random thought. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I, and that was, we touched on this already too, but like for me, it wasn't about that. Me, I wanted to, I wanted to be JP Walker on rails. I wanted to be Peter line on jumps. I mm-hmm. wanted to be, and that, those were unachievable. Mm-hmm. I, I was never going to be that guy. So it was, it was the pursuit of that. That was, and then along with it came all these other things. And I didn't think about it that way. I didn't mm-hmm. think like, one day kids are going to look up to me. That wasn't, that wasn't even, there wasn't time because we were always doing something. It wasn't, it wasn't that those thoughts didn't kind of creep into the, like you're saying, what's Louis doing? Like it, there wasn't, there wasn't space enough in the brain to, to, to get to that. It was just what's next. Like it was Mm -hmm. so, and it's fun. So present, no social media too. Also that probably contributes that time period. Speaking of all the yeah. social media, I got a uh, question, Patreon question, from uh, Joey Weimer. Fired up. Well, Joey, that's my dog. I that's your dog. Out. Yep. In the era of no social media and people only knowing you from videos and magazines, how often did local shreds recognize you and offer to pay for your night? More than I'd probably want to admit on here. Um, if you went to some, you know, if you were in a city. No big deal. You could walk around without a hoodie on or something. If you were in a ski town during the the heyday, it, you got recognized all the I mean, it, just that's what people were into. They live in a ski town and all the time. I mean, to the point where it was annoying. Like the they trying to go to the supermarket after you're done snowboarding and I didn't I, I didn't like that part of it. I didn't I didn't like making small talk when I didn't want to, it was fine if it was on my time and I was in a good mood. And I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I kind of felt like I had to put on a show a lot. You couldn't, you couldn't really express how you, how you felt or to just like, cause you're, then you're going to be the jerk. Right. And this, and then you, I had enough wherewithal to think, well, this kid is like, he probably didn't want to say anything to me. He probably was tripping out in his brain, but he's like, well, maybe I'll never have, you know, I had enough of that in my brain. So I was like, well, don't be a jerk to this guy. And if I was ever a jerk, I'm sorry, but it, it kind of dehumanized you. Like you had to put your, your emotions on check and always kind of be on the stage. And and that part of it, I didn't like, and there's going to be parts of a job, I guess you don't like, but, um, and as far as partying and, and drink, yeah, it, um, always people buying you, you beer and stuff. But on the flip side, I, I was buying beers too. You know, I, I would stoke out, I would meet a guy and, and he would say, are you coming? You know, you, you, you're the reason I moved to freaking tell you right. And I'd be like, well, cool, man, let's go have a beer. You know, it wasn't, I didn't see myself any different than, than they did. I just, I felt as it, the first year st- or, or so it was pretty cool. But then, um, after that, it, it would affect you, you know, when you'd go to the store or when you're in a mountain town, how you, how you operate it. Because, I do have a, a social anxiety thing. Like I really, I get weirded out if I get pinned in a corner at a bar and like there's dudes yelling at me and I'm like answering questions about stuff that I have no idea, you know, and you do that enough. Like, I just want to have like, a, can we just have like a rational, do we have to yell? And like, and you're kind of put in a lot of these situations because, you know, like shop tours and like, you're kind of always on stage, I guess. And I didn't, that wasn't, if I had to say what the worst part of, of a, of a snowboarding career was that that was the hardest for me maybe not worse but that was the hardest was dealing with with people recognizing you and you could tell you can see the look and they're you know you, you can see them coming you're just like oh boy and, and i'd get like anxious like not to blow it and make sure you're nice and, and it gets exhausting you know does it still happen it does yeah but not net it happens enough now to where i can i'm kind of stoked you know yeah. like, you see the look coming you're like oh yeah i remember that you know 2018, I went on a trip with Volcom to Australia with Terje, and I noticed every night at dinner when we were in a mountain town, he was at a different table eating dinner with just some people that approached him. 
and they would end up buying him dinner, and it was like awesome thing for them, and he would have dinner with them every night. And at the bar, he would always be off with different people that pinned him in a corner. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I imagine that was every night for you in a mountain town. Yeah, it was pretty I, – I just stopped going out. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, but if you're not if you're not into it, that'd be not that I don't like it, but you yeah. want it you want it on your own time, and, yeah, the, and then a lot of times, day. and then a sponsor like it didn't matter, like, especially if you're in a town like let's say Mammoth or Mammoth is so condensed, and I I spend a lot of time down there because that's where the best park was, and every night could be a dinner if you wanted it to be every single night from the day that that chairlift opens to the day it closes, you could find some company that was there that's affiliated with you enough to buy you some dinner. But not, then you're eating like crap, and you're not, and you're out in that environment every night. I couldn't do what I needed to do during the day and be out in that environment that, you know, the bro bra getting super wasted, and everybody wants to see you drunk and mm-hmm. jumping on the tables, and it's almost like you, you have an alter ego that that is that guy. Okay, I'm gonna be that guy tonight. Sometimes you know you're just like, okay, well. And then eventually, after six or seven, you're just like, I am that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you're not even trying. Yeah. You are. <laughs> you're believing your own lie because you're actually that guy. You know. Support for the Bombhole Podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Manscaped, the leaders in male grooming. Now, they have the Performance Package 4.0 and the Body Wash. That's the hot items you're going to want to get this holiday for a gift. Now, what do you got in front of you there, buds? I got the lawnmower 4.0, and it's not just great for grooming; it's great for groin grooming. Absolutely, I got to tell you, um, I found out on another podcast I was listening to that these things are actually waterproof. On a different ad read I was listening to, and uh, so I keep that bad boy perched on the edge of my shower, and it's got a freaking light. You're not going to electrocute yourself. Wow! It's no, not no toaster in the bathtub. No toaster in the bathtub. It is. It's good. You're not going to electrocute yourself. It's waterproof. And uh, keeps it smooth as eggs down there. I can just see you in the shower right now, trying to trim down smooth as an egg scenario in the dark. <laughs> Attention to detail. You don't. Even, you can kind actually. Of a, you can, kind of a weird picture in my head. Well, but. you don't. What I do since the lights so good, I don't even turn the lights on. You know, I just go in. I go in the dark, and I just <laughs> should see this thing. It's like a fucking headlamp for your well, fucking crotch region. Headlamp for the crotch. <laughs> So awesome! Again, uh, you can use this thing in, in a cave where while it's raining, you're good to go. You can pretty much use this thing anywhere. This could be the back of an airplane in the bathroom <laughs> on a on a trip overnight to Europe. Yes, you could. You could be rolling in fresh, smooth as an egg. Yeah. Uh, sorry to whoever has to clean up those pubes, but wait, what are you going to do? That is a disaster. Huh? That is a bit of a disaster. So, uh, but yeah, if you're interested in picking one of these bad Larrys up, head on over to manscapes.com. Use promo code bombhole. What do you get, buds? You get 20% off, which for the holidays is huge. That's a great gift for anyone. Uh, again, manscaped.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. Um, so I think we, we should just pivot into a great little topic. I know you've you've done a bunch of, uh, we're going to call them NBDs, never been done. Uh, fun topic. I know first person to do 1080, first person to do a 1080 unit powder, uh, 450 onto the rails. And before we get into that, there's one thing I do want to ask you. Eddie Wall told me a story uh, that you invented the chicane, but some guy came to your house. Oh my gosh, Eddie! And and basically uh, said that you didn't invent the chicane. Said that he did. He said that his friend did. I think. Friend I don't. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Let's hear this story. The source, come to the source, my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this kind of goes right along with that we were talking about that fame thing and and like how you can be weirded out. And so I'm a pretty reclusive man. I mean, I liked. I had a a ramp in my garage and. Like they could go skate down there and cause Truckee didn't have a whole lot of stuff going on at that time, skate park wise before the skate park. And Salaz had one in his house just down the street, but his was like ultra mini and mine was like six foot pool coping. Aaron Sedway made it. Um, and uh, yeah. So along the, the lines of uncomfortable famous things that happened, um, uh, people didn't know where I live. I mean, I, w- I would have boxes stolen, and so I couldn't have boxes, like, delivered to my house in Truckee anymore, um, stuff like that. But long story long, the story that Eddie was talking about was I'm just sitting at my house, uh, drinking beer on a, like, leisurely Saturday-ish kind of feeling day, which a lot of Saturday could be a Tuesday when... <laughs> <laughs> when you don't go by the standard, but it was it kind of had that vibe to it, like just kind of chilling out. Nobody, you know, my, there was nobody at the house, just a rare kind of Kevin gets to hang out by himself day. And I'm doing, you know, 
yard work and and kind of a fall sort of a situation just to paint the picture and just chilling and and this car drives up and like parks like across the street and this dude gets out and walks across the street and I'm in, I'm like at my front door and it's like a it's like a small two story house and I got a small driveway and this dude's like walking at me. I'm like, not like, Hey, how like, no, Hey, how are you doing yet? Like he, he waited till he got into my driveway to start talking to me. And he starts talking to me like, Hey, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm right here. What's up. I, I thought maybe I hit his car in the parking lot on a beer run. Like what, like, who is this dude? He look kind of looked like a shredder ish, but it was summertime. So it's like, or fall. So kind of had some shorts, like maybe, like kind of a weird kind of haircut thing going on. Like just kind of like something off with this dude. And I'm kind of getting like backing up to my door. So I could just be like, and he's like, Hey, I want to talk to you about that, that trick you made up. And I was like, Oh, okay. He's a snow. Like, okay. At least I, I'm not fear of my life right now. Cause he came on kind of strong. And he says, that chicane trick, you didn't invent that. And I'm like, I never said that I did. And he's like, and then, but I mean, and he kind of, that didn't stop his stride. It didn't stop. I, I told him, I, di- I didn't think that I invented it. Who cares? You know, trying to calm him down. It's like, my friends in Oregon made that. And that trick's called a dump truck. And I'm like, are you talking about Marcus Agee and like Dirksen and the McAllister crew? You're talking about the bachelor crew? Yeah. They call a dump truck a backside rodeo. Actually, it looks like a dump truck, you know, and I'm, I'm doing the thing with my hand and he's starting to get all, he's like, you didn't invent that trick. And I'm like, hey, dude, come in the house. We'll go have some beers. We'll calm down. We'll, we'll iron this out. So I invited him in my house at this point. I'm like, this dude's got to, like, he needs some education, right? So I get this dude in my house. I hand him a Budweiser. Uh, and I, we're sitting on my couch, and I'm having to explain the fact that I didn't invent this trick to this guy in my living room of my house. So the guy had to find out where I lived, track me down when I'm there. How many times did he drive by when I wasn't there? Like, see me out in the front yard. Like, this dude was pissed that I, that his friends weren't getting the credit for this trick. And I'm like, I just, and this took about 45 minutes to get this guy out of my house now. And I just explained, well, the X Games said that I invented it. I never, the first person I saw do it was Andy Hetzel, but he did it more like a front flip to a front side, front flip to a front side 180. It was more over the top. And I was just emulating his trick, but I happened to do it a little bit more cork style because I wanted to do it more like make it look like the front side of what Peter Line invented, you know? Like it was just like the natural progression, right? And uh, he just couldn't he couldn't deal with it. And I told him at the X Games, I did it at the X Games, and they, they took it and ran with it. And true story, Jimmy Halopoff's sitting next to the announcer guy, and he's asking me, what do you call that trick? I'm like, I don't know. And Jimmy, drunk Jimmy, just yells... I, it looks like a chicane, you know, like a, the curves on a racetrack. And that dude just took it and ran with it. And then he set it on the air at the X Games. And that, that was the end of the story. I never claimed I invented it or not. But X Games loves to build a good story up, right? But it was like this guy, I mean, it was like angst, pissed off to the point that you're going to drive to somebody's house. I mean, it, that was one of those, like, it's kind of funny that question comes up and we're talking about, like, the fame thing and how weird it is. It's like, um... Dude, I'm just a dude who snowboards. Like I'm not I'm not the guy you think I am, really. You know. Here's a beer. I guess know? today we have social media so people don't have to go to your house and do that, but that's borderline psychopath, huh? Yeah, that's that was uh I remember thinking about that going, Yeah, you gotta you know, that's something your mom wears you warns you about that you're just like, Yeah, whatever. I'm not I'm not freaking Robert Plan. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff, you know. Well, along these lines <laughs> of uh inventing tricks you know, with the 1080 and the 450, I know that there was a cool story behind the 450. Uh, the 450 is one of my favorite stories um, because of the players involved. Uh, Jeff Anderson and Todd Hazeltine had, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They had drug a rail up. This is like preseason in Mammoth. It, it, it snowed just like it did the last storm we had here, like 10 inches. And then, you know, you, in those days, you had your little spots. Like, okay, you can make a turn there. You know, you went up, you hiked around, and, and so, but they saw a grassy little pumice spot. They put a rail there. It snowed on it, and then we built a jump. And, like, hey, let's go up and hit this rail. And Todd was a filmer who ended up working for MacDog, who um, 
in a lot of ways gave me my start with Mac Dog and with Billabong for that matter. Props to Todd. Um, so we get up there to this jump and me and Jeffy, it's kind of like, I think it was the second time we had shredded that year because it just snowed. So the first day we, we would go up and we'd set up a bunch of the mammoth um, picnic tables and we would just configure them all weird ways. And there's just this one little grass hill and everybody would come out and shred. Eddie was there. Eddie would come and just all the lokes around there would come out and just super rad vibe. Everybody would shred. And, but they kind of had this little thing in the woods that was like private, you know. So we get up there and we're doing 270s, you know, just kind of easing into the thing, frontside 270s. And and Jeffy's cab 270. And, and he kind of over rotates one and almost goes 450. And I'm like, dude, I just pull a little harder. Like, you totally got it. And he just walked to the top, pulled a little bit harder, landed on the last three feet of the rail and did... I think it's in a movie, um, one of Todd's movies. Uh, maybe I forget which movie it's from, but he he lands this thing, and I'm like right in front of my eyes on day two of the season. Like this dude, Jeffy. I mean, that's what Jeffy did though. But just pulls this like the a, a new thing, like the next the next progression of a trick, right? So I tried it a few times, and I I don't believe that I got it that day at that rail. It was kind of it the runway kind of came in like this and then flattened out to the rail. So he was going, however it was, he, he was going off of his toes. Cause you know, back in the day when people spun off their toes, <laughs> come on people spin off your toes, please. Um, <laughs> so, and it was a setup for me. So I had to go off my heels so I couldn't get the 450 thing with my heels. So anyways, long story long, I went and learned it in the mammoth park and um, put it in my run at the slope style competition in the X games. And so everybody thought, once again, I never said that I invented it. It just, I was the first one to do it in a more public environment and that move. And back then the movies, there was no Instagram or something. So the movie didn't come out till the end of the year, the next year. So the X games aired first. So everybody thought that I invented it. I was like, and I was always, even at the X Games, I think I said, no, my buddy Jeff invented it. So like, your new trick, your new trick. I'm like, no, wait a minute. Let's give some credit to the man who, mm -hmm. you know, the legend that he is that um, created the trick. So that was all Jeffy. Let's lean into what you were saying there earlier. Because if you notice, if you watch any one of your video parts or contest runs or anything, like the front nine, front 10 off the toes is like fucking just, it's like taking candy from a goddamn baby for you, it looks like. But what's your... What is your take on toes versus heels? Uh, I think if you spin off your, my take is that if you spin off your heels and you don't spin off the lip of the jump, then that's legit. If you spin halfway or wreck the takeoff of a pat down for the next guy, that ain't cool. So that, I mean, that's my take. You can act if like you, toe popping doesn't destroy a, toe popping though. You can dig a fucking big old toe. But you don't, those. but you don't toe pop then off that. Then you heel pop. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you got to have both in your arsenal. Yeah. And you did always do, you had always had both in your parts. But the, for the, con for me, the contest thing was all about the toe pop because those land, those takeoffs were as hard as rocks. So I had more confidence spinning off my toes and those, off those jumps because it just locked in and then you just pop it and then and if you're at a contest it's like i'm not there for fun you're there to win the money so you can go to alaska i mean that's that's all that or your sponsor make your sponsors happy contests there's nothing about them that's really fun winning is fun the check is fun but it's all these are things you have to do seeing your bros is fun you know sometimes that's the only way you get to see your bros and some of the best sessions are those so that's fun but the actual contest it's nerve-wracking it's like you got these dudes in your face like hey bro did that hurt like ah, and you're like your goggle lenses are popped out and you're bleeding. It's like, get away from me. <laughs> you know, they wait till the sun goes behind the mountain and then decide to have the contest. You're like, what? It was soft like an hour ago. Okay. This is a good time to talk about liquid death. Now, uh, each and every one of these cans sold, 10% uh, of all profits go to fighting the war on plastic. And I'll tell you what, we put down 10, 15, maybe, maybe a, a clean baker's dozen probably on average, 
Uh, that's 13. Yeah, that's 13 exactly. for the record. Uh, and, you know, I got the carbonated. You got the non-carbonated. Mm-hmm. Straight from the Alps. And if you're thinking about uh, crushing some water that looks like beer, head on over to liquiddeath.com slash bombhole. It helps us out. You support the show. And you get to crush some can. With that being said. You also get some free koozies. You do get some free koozies. Let's get into the spinning wheel of death. Here we go. And this is Mikey LeBlanc's voice for the uh, for the record, KJ. Nice. Welcome to the liquid death. Death, death, death. Spinning wheel of death. <laughs> I'll have to say that this is the most nerve-wracking part of doing your shows. This is? Yeah. The spinning wheel? This is where we do... It's it's not about talking about yourself. It's not about... like n- None of that stuff. About, like, this is the crux of the bomb hole. Right here. <laughs> the crux. Give it a spin. Good spin. Solid spin right there. Rock climbing trivia. Oh, boy. So we, we had a... Rock... Bu- a new category? We had category. a bunch of trivia... The other one was celebrity trivia. I was going to have you battle buds in celebrity trivia. Uh, I hope I'm not battling him in rock climbing trivia because I am not <laughs> we, the one. We could, uh, <laughs> we could, do, we could, you could throw an answer out, buds, first just to see how you just do. Just see how I do. Just see yeah. how you do. Well, let's try. Do you need a couple names? I, I know some names. So here just on throw the, Dave Hatchet out there. Yeah. I mean, you can't lose with that. All right. Here on the bomb hole, we love making fun of rock climbing probably more than any other sport. So this is really warms my heart to uh, get into. As it should be. Yeah. You should. Make fun of sports that you're eventually... I'm not built for it. <laughs> probably. So. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. That's not true. All right. If, and then fast forward two years, I'm literally like, I got a fucking backpack full of ropes. I'm <laughs> just this gonna this be, guy's soloing up. Yeah, fuck, who knows where? Yeah. You know what? The rock climb is pretty fun. I kind of like it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Rock climb trivia. Buds, you, you take a stab at these first. All right. At what point does bouldering become highballing? Like what, what height? 10 feet. Incorrect, but close. Um, to be honest, I didn't know there was an actual number that... It's more of a feeling? ...that somebody had come up with. Um, I would say that they would probably... If, if they, whoever made this question, I would say about 15 feet. That is exactly correct. He knows his I shit. I was going to go 15, man. Okay, here we but go. But that's all relative. Yeah. Next question. Who was first to free climb... El Cap. Lynn Hill. Lane Nack's father. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Lane Nack's father? Lonnie Kalk? Lonnie. Oh, Lonnie. Oh, no. It's, uh, it was, she's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Lane Nack has deep roots in. Uh, Lonnie. Lane Nack's father. <laughs> I said was, Lonnie. Was the first. <laughs> Can we get an air horn for Lane Nack, please? Lonnie. And his father. Yeah, and Lonnie. Lonnie. And his Lon- brother Frank, they got a good crew over there. Um, um, I saw that movie. I, though I should have got that one right. So the answer he said. said it right was uh, was Lynn Hill. Didn't That's Lonnie's right. father do something crazy? Uh, Lonnie's father is pretty much like um, I don't know how to compare that to snowboarding, but it would be like the, one of the top ten. Like he's uh, one of those guys, just a complete yeah. rock climbing legend. Um, like. You're never, us mortals will never get to that level. And he does a lot of soloing, right? He did. Not not like, soloing's kind of a personal thing. Like, you got to be willing to really. No ropes. No rope. Like you got to be willing to. It, it, the way that uh, somebody explained it, Tommy Caldwell, I believe, is you're doing a, like a, a 10. You're getting a gold medal at the Olympics, like in a gymnastics routine. But if you fall or mess up, you die. You die. So it's it's a totally personal, like, you have to be on a whole different, like, I can't even fathom. I can get 15 feet up on a boulder and get scared and be like, there's no way. Like, Climb a whole peak. It's a whole different level of commitment and, yeah, and mind that, control. That movie where the guy's wife is just like, I don't know, and everyone yeah, could be his last one. It, All, right. All right, next question. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, so, Buds, why don't you, you take a stab at answering this first because I think there's no fucking way you're going to get it right. Lane Nack's father. So, here we go. <laughs> what is a monkey fist in the world of rock climbing, Buds? A monkey fist? Yeah, what is that? That is when you uh, you you fall uh, when you're bouldering <laughs> and a rock intrudes in your anus. 
Monkey fist. Uh, not correct, but close in some yes. weird close. <laughs> That is close. <laughs> that is really close. What do you got for us? Uh, I believe it's the name of a knot. Yes, it is. <laughs> that you can put in your anus. <laughs> yep, close. Well, yeah, there's a lo- lot of lonely nights out there in the woods. That's what I, that's what I thought. Uh, <laughs> somehow the anus gets involved. The old oh. prison pocket. Their answer they have is trad climbing slam, slang for a type of fist gym. All that is like jargon I don't understand. That sounds like some anal jargon, if you ask me. Fist gym? Oh, no, no. That was the answer I fucking did. It was a, it was a trivia. I fucked that up. No, it's a form oh. of climbing gear uh, pro made from knotted rope. Yeah, basically. So he's right. It's a knot. He's right. Okay, last question. Buds. Guy knows his stuff. Buds, I'm going to see how you do on this one. What was the first rock climbing grading system ever used? Buds? Grading system? Yeah, it's a grading system for level, oh, like levels of difficulty. Levels of difficulties? What, like 1 through 10? Yeah, but there's, it's like, you know how there's like um, <laughs> different increments for measurement? It's a type of system. A system? There's the Dewey Decimal System, things like that. Oh, like a numbering system. Yeah. The Dewey Decimal's for the library, right? Yes, it is. Microfiche, maybe? I have no clue. What Microfiche system, is that your answer? No, I don't know. That's another <laughs> system. I don't, it's, a, it's a system to calibrate feet? Like, what are we talking? Uh, um, or how hard? I, I think how difficult point. it is. It's the point system. Yes. It also could be like a scale of some sort. Of how difficult the mountain yeah. is. Do you want to throw in, in just a random? Uh, one through five? I have no clue. Okay, so he's out. You got an answer for us? Lenak's father? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, is the right answer. <laughs> uh, the, probably the first rock climbing scale was, I don't know, some guys like, that's hard. <laughs> that, that was pretty easy. I, like the first accepted one. Um I, I'm not. Ex- I'm not exactly sure. Um, I know the w- the YDS is the most accepted form this day in America. I'm sure they had something in Europe going before that. I'm, you know, you, I might learn something today. So the you, well, you the YDS is the Yosemite Decimal System, and that is not correct because I answered that on this trivia. The correct answer is the Benish Scale. And that is all we have today on today's <laughs> he, trivia. He had to throw in a re- and, and yes. what is the Benish scale? We yeah. don't even know what it is. Yeah, who's Benish? Yeah, who is this guy? I've heard of Whitey McConaughey. So Benish. we just lost like half of our <laughs> listeners right now with rock carving <laughs> trivia. They're, they're all like that lobby. Uh, There's a couple people in micro puffs listening to this that are extremely height. excited. Yeah, I almost wore my micro puff and my harness in today. Just. Just harnessed in, just to fucking really let them know you're into it. And let me state for the record, I'm not good at it. Oh, no. just, I just enjoy it. You just like it. Yeah. All right, we're going to ask a Patreon question. First of all, thank you to all the Patreon members. You guys truly help us keep the let's lights give, on. Let's give them a big old air horn. Huh? An air horn, right? Oh, yeah. This is from our good friend Stephen Duke. It became the obvious. Duke snort. Yeah, the Duke. It became obvious to me that you ran your boots looser than anyone I'd ever seen. Like you tie them once when you get a new pair and then never untie that knot. What made you think you could get away with this nonchalant behavior? (laughs) Uh, A little backstory on Duke. Awesome shredder. Uh, Plagued with knee injuries. He actually has a tattoo on his knee. It says endless bummer. Poor Duke snort. (laughs) Thanks for the question, Duke. Uh, While staying in my house in Mammoth, he watched me laced my boots one day and he, and he just stared at me. He just was in awe of, he's like, what do you, like, that's what you do. You know, when I get a pair of boots, I rip, first of all, rip all any, all the shoelace stuff that's in there. They have like an inner thing and all this stuff. It's like, rip that out, rip the conventional footbed out, put your own footbed in and have nothing. I don't want to tie my boots four times. Right. So basically the deal is, and I used to put them in a warm bath so they would loosen up. They'd always, they were, they, and they also went through this stage boots did where it had to be stiff. Torsion, laterally, like stiff. And I'm like, dude, why does it stiff in the back? It makes me walk like a skier all day long. Like, well, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I'm in these things from the sun up to sundown. Why does it have to have forward lean in a boot? Isn't that what your high back's for? So long story long is that those things were made to be comfy, right? And so I got a new pair of boots. I got them where I liked them. And then I tie one knot, tie in a double knot, tie it as tight as I can, and I never touch the knot again the rest of the... Slip the foot in. Slip the foot in. I actually brought a boot. Yeah, let's do a little demonstration here. So 
this is the same knot that's been in here. Is that a monkey fist? This is a monkey fist, and it has not been in bed's anus. <laughs> good. So, the old sniff test. Yeah, yeah no, no idea, pink eye also, which is good for that. There's no, there's no, none of that business in there. Your bind, that's what your binding does. You get straps and all this stuff, right? So you just, and then in the morning, you get your boot, and you guys probably can't see this, but you just tie them, right? Well, it's not on For the foot. listeners, he's basically doing some type of, uh, like, weaving with a, a pre-knotted lace. It's already knotted. And he's just you imagine running it up through the lace in there. Lace. Yeah, and then, well, that's a really horrible. That's a soft boot, boot too. But it's just... And you can do it when you have it on your foot. You just lace, you know, in the morning, you got 90,000 things going on. You got making your smoothie or whatever you're eating for breakfast. Breakfast is a pain in the ass, by the way. And then you're, you got your coffee and you got, you're waxing your board. You got all these other things. Why do you want to spend 10 minutes on your boots? You put that thing on your feet and you just go, and you're out. Done. The pro tip. And then you don't got to take, then you, like, you don't get to the resort and you're spending another five minutes doing your boots there. It's just like, it's done. Have you tried BOA? Uh, the first time, I had a boa was with Jimmy out in in the Tahoe backcountry, Jimmy Halpop, and he tightened the thing up and it broke. So the early days of boa. So I was anti-boa yeah. from that moment forward. And I didn't like the boa because they tried to push it too. Um, I didn't like it because you tighten up this thing and like say you want your um, your toes to be a little looser, like your feet are getting cold, you couldn't do that. So I'm officially anti-boa. You know what I like is this is going to be another warranty tech issue where it's like the guy's going to also buy a pair of boots, rip out the entire uh, interlacing system, and then call call the boot company and say. You do that? Oh, do you do that too? No, I don't. I, 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 I actually rock stiff boots, but I run them. I do run boots loose at the beginning until they break in. But but I love, I can't wait for the warranty calls. Of, uh, <laughs> uh, I bought some boots and ripped out the Kevin interlacer. J- Kevin, and then I also <laughs> back, I also ran over my snowboard with a truck <laughs> and it broke. But <laughs> can you guys send me another pair? I like what you said about putting them in the bath. Pat Moore once told me I'd, I had stiff boots once. And he's like, oh, just take a shower with your boots on. Yeah. That was his technique. Like a, but yeah, it's the same tech. But then you, but then you run the risk too of having like your just – like having two mops on your feet. You yeah. Know, like there's absolutely nothing left in there, you know, but I don't mind that. That being said though, I run a lot of forward lean, like even on rails, I run the same forward lean on everything. And it's because usually, it's not in your boot. It, yeah. And yeah. It's, it, there's no stiffness in my boot. And that's just, I don't, my feet hurt at the end of the day. I just, you're in your boots all day. I want them to, and my straps are super tight and my, I run a lot of forward lean. So I figure that's your bindings department. You get in there for that 30 seconds or, three minutes you're taking your run your feet kind of hurt and then you give your feet a break that's that's how i do it Mm -hmm. good technique i think this is a good time for a guest question from none other than willie mcmillan oh no here we go willis what up bomb hole what up cage willie mcmillan here this is actually a request kevin will you do a cover of face to face using your mouth you know what I'm talking about. Hook at me. Great, great request because that's not you can't call that a question. Uh, yeah, more of a request. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Dave Downing will really like this too because whenever. On a side note. Yeah. Uh, definitely air horn worthy there. Um, on a side note, we had a. If it was a, it hadn't snowed in a while and Dave was in town and Eddie, we would get together and we had a 15 under club. So if we we're going to hit the rails that day, we would all mount boards that were under 150. And it wasn't like you're jumping that day. It was just everything, every chance you got, you rode as slow as you can and everything was just, whoosh, you had to be on your nose or your tail or like, it was fun. Okay. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> But every time, so we'd be going down the mountain, and, and Downing, he would be going. <laughs> so this song is a face-to-face song from, I want to say it's Aaron Vincent's video part. And how that song came to be part of the story, I have no idea. So then now every time I strap into my board, and I'm going to a rail, that song goes through my brain. 
So I'll, I'll be sitting on top of a rail, whether it's a park or it's some street rail thing that's just like, you're scared. And it's... <laughs> so I'll get random, I'll get random like over the years between Downing and and uh, Eddie of just... Beep. There's your insider joke of the day. <laughs> That's a heater. Also, the yeah. musical talents kind of came back out, out of the woodwork there. <laughs> Little uh, almost beatbox kind of vibes there. It's kind of code for it's code for jibbing. You know? It is okay. And the one fifty and under clubs, no joke. I can't wait to get that going and just put up a back lip and like ping on the way up, just back taco a kink this year. <laughs> <laughs> like, God damn it! In uh, your super soft boots and, <laughs> and, and my run, run over, oh, run, over run over my over snowboard. Your snowboard. <laughs> That's what we've learned so far. You go get your snowboard, you run it over, you drill holes in the middle, you rip out all your inner liners, yeah. and then you basically sing a face-to-face -face song before hitting any type of metal feature. You're good to go. That sounds. You like got the formula. We're fucking doing great. Okay, well, let's talk about another uh, another era of uh, KJ Cage. We're gonna call yeah, you Cage. Nicholas Cage. That's that's bad. We won't go. That's what that. Nick Russell <laughs> calls me. Oh, really? Nicholas <laughs> Cage. Yeah. Give him a good old. When we get together, it's Nicholas Cage. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Um, but around the, around the peak of your career, uh, there, there was kind of almost a bit of a Jay-Z and Beyonce scenario going on. Oh boy, I knew two, this was the coming. The two <laughs> biggest names in snowboarding and, uh, you know, yourself and Terry Takitas were dating and you, you started a snowboard company together. Can you just walk us down that road, paint a little picture of what that period of your life was like? Cause it was like, it was, I mean, as a, as a consumer, I, I would loved it, you know? Okay. Let's say you have... Two of Elon Musk's rockets, right? Is he the dude that's putting the people in space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have one here. Like, you've heard, like, the candle burning at both ends, right? Yes. You've heard of that. So you have two people involved, and you have, like, it's not a candle. There's no slow burn. You have, like, two super obsessed, super very much involved in their careers at this point, at the height of both of their careers, and they decide they're going to date on a pretty public there has no other way of being public, right? Um, and the stresses that causes, and you know, so it kind of, unfortunately, didn't really have a chance to to go beyond what it did, you know. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's a tough question. It, um, that was hard for both parties involved, for sure. Because we were still in our the breakup, and then that we were still interlaced with all these companies and stuff, and then, um, yeah, I mean for fans and stuff, it was probably great, but it, it definitely um, there was great times, and then there was also a lot of hard times with that. You know, there was a lot of you couldn't just cut. You couldn't just peace out, you know. And we were such great friends before, and we eventually became great friends after, but it just took time. So I don't necessarily want to talk about that no. anymore out of respect for her and my wife and stuff. But, yeah, that was definitely, um, in, on paper, it looked great for both of us, and we actually discussed it, you know, like why it's so hard, and it's something we both wanted, whereas one of the things you don't have in snowboarding per se is a is a some sort of normal structure and when i say normal is like a, a companion like you had your bros but you don't you don't get the luxury of having like girlfriends and relationships are super hard in this sport and that's i'm sure that's the same today as it's, as it's ever ever been just travel alone like you're and and then you've got this kind of like pseudo famous thing going on and and it, it just breeds insecurity it breeds, you're gone. You're worrying about what your chick's doing. You're gone. And she's worrying about what you're doing or he or, you know, however your relationship structure is, is set up. Um, it makes it really difficult. So we just thought, hey, was, we already have this, you know, this love thing was forming and we just decided to give it a go. And it, and it kind of it kind of didn't work for whatever reason. So, but we gave it a go. Well, let's, yeah, let's pivot into another topic here because, uh, I was speaking with um, Louis Parody on the phone yesterday, and um, <clears throat> he 
huge fan of yourself and and you know um he's mm. one of one of the best to do it i'm a huge fan of him oh that's killer so we just i got an impromptu fired up a guest question from and this he actually the board is a 158 one not a 159 to preface this he told me afterwards so here we go hey uh what's up this is Luis Friday. um Hey, Kevin, I have a question for you. Uh, I have, I grew up on uh, riding this uh, Kevin Jones Genius 159. And, uh, yeah, I was just wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit about Genius, uh, how it started, and why it went. That's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> uh, hey, what's up, Louis? Um, yeah, man, uh, the, the coolest part about snowboarding is you can – call up on some weird podcast thing that you never thought you'd be sitting here and a guy like you would be calling me saying that you're influencing me. Wait, I said that wrong. That I'm influ I influence you and the, then the full circle comes around that I watch you now and you're influencing me. That's that community. That's that like you guys like you keep me going. That gives me chills, man. That's thanks so much for the for the um for the question. Um, genius was, yeah, that was a heavy time. Um, I, we just kind of went over that with uh, my girlfriend at the time, um, Tara, who needs an, I don't know if we gave her an air horn. She <laughs> might need to like the big air horn. She's what she did in snowboarding was completely, um, unexpected and, and I, I can't, I'm trying to think of people that have blown the sport out like that in such a short amount of time. And she's definitely, I mean, switch backside rodeo in your, in your video part into powder and dudes weren't even doing that, you know, not that, you know, whatever dudes and you can have whatever feeling you want to on that. That's not this debate. I'm just saying like really big, you know, she had shots in her video part that dudes wanted in her video parts. I mean, that was big back then. Um, so she, yeah, she was involved and Eddie and funny story about Andreas. I called Andreas and to get him on board and he, he was sitting in his, cause in, uh, Norway, he, you have to do that mandatory military stuff, you know? So he was sitting in his barracks. He's like, I cannot talk, but I'm going to talk, you know, like he, before he got kind of Americanized, you know, like the, those guys go through this, they can barely speak English and. Like, hey, dude, I want you to ride for, you know, I was, I was, I was getting into the thing. I'm like, I want to get you to ride for Genius, you know, and he was super, like, I could just imagine him in the, in barracks sleeping with like a hundred other dudes and on his cell phone, like trying to hold his enthusiasm, you know, like, so that's a cool story. Those are the ones you look back on and you're just like, that was really cool. Genius started, uh, Peter Line called me on the phone and said, hey, I want to start a snowboard company. So in the beginning, it was going to be me and Peter. And if Peter Lyon calls you at that time and says, I want to do anything with you, you're not only are you like starstruck, but you're, you're like, yeah, dude, you got the formula. You know, like, look at what you've done on a snowboard and in business. Like, so we, you know, did that for a while back and forth. How's this going to work? What's it look like? But this was in the, in the age of, uh, I had just gotten out of my contract with Lamar, which was a nightmare because they sold the company and we weren't supposed to be sold as assets, meaning the contracts weren't sold as an asset to the company as our, my contract read. So when, if they sold the company, I wasn't sold as part of that. Yeah. So Lamar ended, they sold the company. I had a few other things that I had to wrap up there in the tune of two years. Um, uh, and it was, uh, I wasn't involved. They just used my name at that point, which was weird because when Bert owned Lamar, Bert Lamar, he was an old professional snowboarder and professional skateboarder, probably deserves a little mini air horn. That dude, uh, was pretty, pretty awesome back in his days. And he rode in Mount Hood in cutoff sweatpants. I mean, cutoff sweatpants. Good look. Come yeah, I like that. on. You know, good, that's not a common good. You don't see that it's enough. It's not a common attire there. Yeah. No, good look. Good look. Pink, too, I believe. Pink. I think you're right. I pink, remember seeing pink that. Pink and purple. and Yeah, good look. Might have to bring it back. Bomb hole shorts? Yeah, we, we could probably sell a few. Some bomb hole sweats. 
We'll actually cut them off ourselves. Mm, Let's do like this. That. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, so me and Peter kicked this idea around, and then so I, I got me I got signed up, and then they hit me up to get my girlfriend at the time, Tara, signed up, and so we got that dialed in, and we got Andreas on board, we got Eddie on board, and then they had a meeting at Forum, and Forum didn't want to let or feel the need to let Peter go, which I don't know if that was planned or not. I think just because of the caliber of the team, maybe that we could both float different companies you know maybe after Tara got involved I, I never was involved in that that part of it I always wondered it's like huh but it's neither here nor there now and then genius went awesome um a lot of the creative uh Peter was still really involved with a lot of the creative and um and I was involved and there was I, I can't remember this guy from the I can't remember his name right now but yet but they had a really good do the creator? I mean, just look at the stickers and the, and the marketing. Well, there's Nico was there, but I'm trying to think of this one guy in particular. Um, yeah, the graphics were awesome. The the fucking colors. The creatively, the company looked awesome. It was just a great. It, it was it, what the reason I love genius is it made fun of ourselves, mm -hmm. and that's that's it was perfect. It was just like, and that was voiced in the beginning. Like we got to do this in a way that that. It's just fun, and it's going to make fun of ourselves. That was really important to me, and I think it was really important to Peter to kind of have the ant antithesis of a, of, a, of a forum. You know, forum was this, not that that was a bad way to mark. It was just, but forum was very, like, freaking awesome. And, it's like, we wanted to be, like, you know, kind of down the underdogs and the, and the, the anti-cool, but that's still cool. Anyway. So then it was a different group. So then I, so I had to kind of get out of my standard films and I kind of had to do the dogger thing. And I remember running into some problems. I'm like, I want to, I was up in Canada. I'm like, dude, I want to film this line. Like it's sun's on it. going to be perfectly on it in 10 minutes. Like I, I'm, I'm like jazzed up. And, and it was, um, we're going to have to get the uh, air horn ready. I think Sean Johnson, um, and Peter, and I believe Pascal, and we're sitting there with the helicopter. There. It literally would have taken me ten minutes to get over there and ride this line and come back, like, it, and because we're we're doing heli shots of this of this jump, and it was right there. And I'm like, dude, let's let's take ten minutes and do this. And and somebody in the group, I'm not going to name any names, just said we don't do that. Whoa! What did I sign up? Like a perfect line? We don't. I do that. This and is I a, a rider. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I was like, well, it's kind of a consensus from a, a few people. Yeah. That that wasn't me and Johnson, and I was like, I do that, you know. And I kind of like my 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 sails got deflated. I'm like, what did I? Kinda, I kind of had a moment of like, what did I do? You know, like if I was with the hatchets, we'd be over there right now. Um, and, and it, to their defense, it, I would be stealing the helicopter away from something that's working right now. So, but it, it just struck, it, I remember it just, it was like, just such a, what, what, what do you mean we don't do that? That's, that's what we're doing. You know, like we're, we're filming snowboarding and something like you wait for these things to be perfect. It's perfect. The snow's good. The avalanche danger's low. The sun's going to be, it's going to be pink in a second, you know? So there was kind of some um, uh, changing. I, I had to kind of shift gears on, on what my what I did for the brand, which was giving a little bit of myself to to concentrate more on like what they were into, which was kind of what Forum was into. And I kind of wanted to do. I kind of thought the idea was to do me. So there, that was the start of like a little bit of a conflict, which I got over quick. But it was my first like whoa, this decision is, is affecting my writing, like the writing I really want to do. Like this jump stuff's cool. I mean, how many back sevens and front nines? And I'm like, that's the once in a lifetime opportunity right there. That's what I'm doing this for. So a little bit of conflict on that, but I was under contract to film with, with these guys. So we did that and we kind of got over that. I had a discussion with the, with them and 
you know, it was pretty open that I needed to be able to do what I wanted to do and have that kind of clout to pull. Like, yeah, it's a big deal. You're pulling a helicopter off, but it literally would have taken a half an hour. Um, so we had those meetings and, and there wasn't bad blood or anything. I don't think from that. Um, and this is kind of the start of, of some weird goings on there. So there's all these rumors flying around, like, are they going to sell? Are they going to, so to, to make a long story long is that Burton ended up buying form and genius as a package. Um, genius was doing good. It, it had made money, which in three years for a hard goods company to make money is pretty, um, pretty amazing actually. Um, but a lot, you know, largely due to those guys had a formula and, and knew how to work it. They definitely knew how to do that well. <laughs> those guys were wild. Yeah, so then Genius was rolling right along, and we were all snowboarding, doing our thing, and just really happy to have this, you know, something that you could maybe retire on, it, and you're putting your ideas into, and you're uh, retire. That's a funny word, huh? I'm, I can't even believe I used that. Something that was going to give you some bisque in the long term when you're kind of done risking your life, right? So things started getting funny and, and phone calls. And, and we went for three years. And uh, and the boards were finally getting there. You know, they, they decided to give me a board the day before, day before um, after practice at the X Games one year. And the boards were super stiff. And so... Um, it was pretty funny to be on. I didn't have time to run over it with my truck, basically. <laughs> but um, I didn't have the right trial. I had was a minivan, you know. Uh, so the long story is they s ended up selling to Burton, and they asked if, if I wanted to continue under the Burton umbrella with Genius. And I was like, no, pay me out, and we can talk about it, you know. So I got... I got a nice check from, from that thing if, if that's what the goal was. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was to have a company and be, be involved and have, it, have longevity out of it. But then a year and a half later, two years later, Burton ended up just clipping genius altogether. Like it, was, it wasn't worth their whatever. You know, they had a round table about it, and they're just like, well, it's, let's just – so they kept for them. And, and our pet project got that we worked hard on and – I know Peter worked really hard on it, and uh, much respect to Peter. Absolutely, needs an air horn. Uh, definitely one of my idols as a kid. Talk about Boreal. I remember the first time I saw him, he was doing switch backside cork 360s off this. At the time, was a pretty big jump in the Mammoth Park at night, and it was boiler ice. I'm like, who is this kid? You know, he's about freaking three feet tall. That was my first when he was on Division 23. That was. Anyways, a little side note on thanks, Peter, for all the inspiration and all the, uh, the conversations that we've had over the years. Um, yeah, so they Burton just bought them, and, and it wasn't worth it for them to continue. So it was a heartbreaker. It wasn't about, yeah, I mean, yeah, I got paid some money, but the, the real heartbreak was just watching your work disappear into, into nothing oh. and, not, and not giving the opportunity for somebody else to – to take it over and continue the, what, what we started. Definitely a special time in snowboarding, though. It's a good, when you look back on the time capsule, you're like, fucking all those videos, you guys riding the boards, the team, the, the graphics, the, the, the brand image, like everything is, you know, a special time. Did you try to get him to break it off from the Burton buy, or that it wasn't even a... It was, it, I wasn't, me and Tara's percentage was, was, uh, was under 50, 51 barely so we didn't we, we didn't have the say they could do you know that was planned you know, yeah it wasn't that wasn't uh and we knew that so yeah i mean they wanted control of their and them. you know what i didn't go into the books I, I didn't it was like that's the decision you guys are making i'm not fighting you guys on this i didn't go in and be like well you know this is i didn't yeah. have the I, I wanted to snowboard i didn't want to be a business guy well at least you got a nice check I did. That's a, that's a good. That's a good thing to realize too. I wanted to snowboard. I didn't want to be a business. Mm -hmm. It's a good learning experience. Totally. And I'm I'm not good at being a business guy. I'm good at being a snowboarder. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I think it's a good time for a uh, name that video part. Here we go. Oh boy. 
That was Lane Next Dad. <laughs> TV TV one. You know Lane Next Dad actually makes music, right? No, I don't. Yeah, he does. He makes like garage junkyard music, like bangs on trash and stuff. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, Name That Video Part is presented by Mammoth Mountain. I personally love Mammoth. It's incredible because the park, if you want to go there and ride park, it turns on really early. Mid-season, you can go there and get shacked, get some powder days. And then you can, a lot of winters, you can ride all the way till July. And in the spring, there, there's nothing better. There really is. We did a trip there last spring. That was actually the favorite time of the mm-hmm. year for me. I've been going there since 99 in the spring for Super Park. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a special time for me. Let's go to Mammoth, the uh, best park in the country, I would yep. say, without a doubt, hands down. Major shout out to the park crew and the builders over there. They build the best park in the country. And uh, the one thing that's really cool is they're sponsoring Name That Video Park which means they're giving away a four-pack of tickets. So if you know the song and you're the first to get it, you're going to get a four-pack of tickets, some bomb hole swag, and uh, you're going to get a chance to go out there and see it for yourself because it's incredible. Just make sure you uh, tag at Mammoth Mountain if you know the winner of Name That Video Part. Absolutely. Uh, they support the show. You should support them. If you go to Mammoth, you're going to have a great time. So we always ask our guests, what's your confidence level 0 through 10 here, KJ? I'm going to go with... Uh Eight point four point three, depending on the era it's from. Okay, I've never seen a the, the two decimals is two, throwing me for a little bit of a two loop. Two decimals. There. I don't know if that's a real number. Yeah, that seems like a maybe a Dewey decimal system type of eight point four. It's it's a climbing thing, you know. Oh, oh if okay. you have a ponytail, you can understand. Right. It. It's like a monkey fist. It's a monkey yeah, fist. it's a split fist. boarding thing. I mean, if you. It's the bashful system. It yeah. almost seems like a pie chart kind of three point four repeating scenario a little yeah. bit. So. Exactly. Whatever so it actually, is. it's zero confidence or 10. Yes. Depending, so. depending on the air. Okay, here so. we go. Let's see how you do. Yo, give me some room of throwing elbows. Timberland boots, Air Force, and shell toes. Who the f is still? If I got a rap a song? In the club, I'm going to go pop the trunk and turn the street by your mouth to 10. I can tell you that was Redman, the artist. That's correct. He's, he's, for the people listening, he's twiddling his fingers trying to channel something. His inner chi. I definitely recognize it. it I'm going to say there is a very similar song. It's not J.P. Walker, last part in The Resistance. That's, that's where my f- head first went, but that was too not, easy. Yeah, it's not that. So just don't say that. First of all, it's a rap song. We can, we you can know, make, you know me in rap, right? Like, don't, I don't, there's no, there's not a rap bone in my body. Um, like, if you asked me a rap song, I'd be like, yeah, the Beastie Boys, right? Um, I'm going to go with something that was in video games. Not correct. I, uh, I might have, have the answer. I have I'll seriously. To you I seriously have no idea. You have I'm it. I'm so bad at it. I'm gonna say Eddie Wall. It's not correct. <sighs> so that's that is Browner in Stand and Deliver. Ooh, and the, a, it's uh, right after my part. Exactly. Isn't it? That's why I'm like, oh, oh it's right, right after the K- KJ's part. Literally, spin me right around, and yeah. Browner comes on. Yeah. Both wow. great parts. Uh, he's that, playing. He's playing hockey, and it's like throwing elbows, and somebody's elbowing against the board. Part. Great, great part. That that's really interesting. That that wasn't right off the tip of my head. That shows you how much I probably Being right after your part. When probably rap comes on, you just blank out. Well, wait. It's either two things, right? You can take this either way. Either I'm a total narcissist and mm-hmm. I just watch my own part and stop right then, or I don't really watch those videos once they come out much because it's like you already did it. It's on to the next. Mm. So you, the, the viewers and the listeners can choose how narcissistic. What I about am. that video it's, premiere tour? That's that, what I was going to say. Yeah. It depends on how big the tour was because you know every song by the end of a tour, you're like, oh, fucking here, here goes we go. Again. Browner's parting out. You know, I didn't tour that much with Stand and Deliver. I think I, I think I uh, decided I needed a like I need to go home for a little bit. Like I don't think we did a European. We didn't do the whole, or I didn't, I should say. Yeah, you, you were like, it was like gone crazy. Here. Well, here at the bomb hole, everybody wins. So we got you a cooler. Oh, thank it's a, you. It's a bomb hole. Participation award. Oh, yeah. but it, diesel. Yeah, it's a bomb hole cooler filled with bomb hole merch. The button's on the top on the left there, or yeah, your well, right. I'm See seeing that? if this is a sticker. Or oh, yeah, this, it's I a mean, sticker. this is like the real deal here. Yeah, this is, uh, that. that's from the guys over at Igloo. They hook it up. And well, thank uh, you, gentlemen. So basically, it hardly open. Yeah, you got it's mugs. seriously so stuffed I can't open it. Yeah, you got stickers, you got oh, a hat. Oh, look at all this yeah. stuff in here. All of this stuff's available at bombhole.com if you want to support the podcast. Oh, it helps us out. 
Yeah, we got some socks. Some, they're actually high quality socks. They got the uh, protective sleeve, as we like to talk about. So, so is this like everybody gets a cupcake? Is this this like entitlement thing that we were talking yes, about? Yes, like it is. Even if you lose, you win. Yeah, like yes. the kids in soccer these days. You know, everyone gets a trophy. Yeah. Well, this is great for me. Well, you, also, I was getting shit because, because uh, you know, everybody's going to give me shit because I've been, oh, you go too easy on the guests. You go too oh, easy. Is that why you stepped and so it up? I'm up? starting to step it up a little bit. I like I'm that. sick of these fuckers. This was a great video part. This was a this was very thought thought heavy. You know, he gave this some this wasn't I'm just gonna randomly pick one. This is like, hey, I'm gonna pick your the only Here's reason one. I said Eddie Wall was because I know he throws meatballs and Eddie's like been mm-hmm. talked about so heavily. That's why I said Eddie Wall. Yeah, good yeah. logic. So he's good logic. Was, stepping his game up. And I don't think Chris Brown I don't think he got the air horn he deserved either. No, but didn't. yeah, Browner, sorry. Browner, dude. Browner's a man. All right, yes, we have yes. a second video part for our listeners trying to preserve the culture and give uh, make sure these videos get the respect they're due. Um, so uh, here we go. If you guys know what it is, you know the drill. You comment on Instagram on a photo of KJ on our Instagram when this comes out. Here we go. I'm going to tell you what I really think I like about Mondays. Could it be like Saturdays? When you don't- That's some snowboard rock right there. Uh-uh. I don't, I don't know got it, but it sounds... I'm going to give a hint to the listeners that... Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. It definitely sounds like a Mac Dog kind of a... That's correct. Kind of a song. Okay, thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. All right, we've been talking about a bunch of stuff, but we really haven't talked about your kind of contest career domination. Well, let's let's just run it back. I mean, you have you've had your own you know, fucking character in a video game. You've had, you know, your own toy character. You've done video parts where you're doing two video parts in one year and winning X Games. You got nine X Games medals. All this stuff, Rider of the Year, out of all of these accomplishments, accolades, what have you, which one means the most to you or which one's your favorite? There's a couple things that that I'm that I'm really proud of in my career. One was FLF Films. We need an air horn for them, which was kind of the the uh, before the standard the Mac Dog thing, and then they they were one of the big three back in the day. And there was a year that they kind of gave me my first shot, and I, and I always wanted to be in the standard films. So um, to make the story semi short, I looked at them and this is going to sound harsh but i looked at that as training for standard it was uh, everything was getting to standard for for me it, for me personally not because of i didn't like what macdog was doing i had a ultimate respect for that but for me the pinnacle was to have a first or a last part in a standard movie and then i would be done and i could die a happy man that that's that was it that was the the upper that was that was as far as snowboarding went in my mind for years i mean that was it um, so there was one year that I filmed, I think it was stomping grounds year for the, would be the reference. I, you know, what's funny is I referenced years of my life through videos. So it's like, okay, TB6, TB5, which, and it still gets jumbled up, but it's not, I don't do 95. I go like, okay, well that was like stomping grounds year or technical difficulty. When you saw me, you said last time I saw you was TB20 year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I do. I, it, that's how my brain works. But I had a part in fall lines film. I had a part in Mac Dog's film, and I had a uh, a part that I'm not really proud of in TB5, but that was my first standard part. So that year was huge because then now everybody's calling me, right? So that that was one, and that showed some a little bit of work ethic. Like this guy is serious, you know, like he wants he wants this, you know. And I think that that I think the filmers. That's what they want. They want to, you can be the most talented guy in the world, but if you don't, if you don't show up and you, you know, you're falling all the time. So that was, that was huge. And then the contest thing kind of, kind of happened. I never wanted to be a contest guy and you got to be careful because once you win one, then it's expected. Then you, the companies are like, Oh, you can be this contest guy. And then next thing you know, your roster the next year is filled with a bunch of contests. And it'd be, no, 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 no. So I did just enough contests and selected the bigger ones that would allow me to do things that I wanted to do. And the thing I wanted to do the most was learn all I could about Alaska and big mountain riding and, and 
which I'm still not good at, by the way. Like I still never had that one trip to Alaska where over a year of my life spent up there, I've never had that year, right? Which is fine because it's still out there. You know, Alaska's not going anywhere. So that would allow me to get the budget to go do things I wanted to do. And if I had to dip into the, my prize money to do so, I would, you know, I would take money out of my own, you know, which sounds kind of a weird thing to say, money out of my own pocket. But, you know, the, the travel budget didn't always cover the, the huge expenses of, of a helicopter. Huge amounts of money. Um, hats off to the hatchets and sla- all these guys, the pioneers up there. Now you can just, there's four different outfits up there. You can shop. You can be like, oh, well, this guy's giving me that. And you can shop around for heli bumps, you know. Um, so the contest thing, it never really excited me. It ne- I never, but I knew I had to, I had to take a chunk of time to do good at these things. That allowed me to do a lot of things in snowboarding was like the X games, for example, like to be the poster boy, of the X games. Well, for a couple of years, I could do whatever I want. I could go spend a month in Alaska if I wanted to, I could, you know, pick these guys brains up there and, and immerse yourself in this culture. It's a whole different culture. There's a whole different side of snowboarding that I wanted to know everything about or go on a street trip. To Alaska and just, you know, see what these dudes are doing. Like, what are they real snow dudes doing up there? I mean, talk about tripping out. I went up there after those dudes and saw what they had set up. And like, I think it was the year, Bo- maybe Bodie won. Did Bodie win? Yeah, Bodie won a few years. Yep. It, the, when he did that big horseshoe rail. That, yeah. That shot up, that, yep. I looked at in that. In Anchorage. Yeah. yeah, in Anchorage. I looked at that thing and how it was, because they didn't rip the stuff apart. It was like an ice cube, right? And I drove by that spot and I was just like, what a madman, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like the compression. Bodie, Bodie is a madman. Yeah, like, he's actually a madman. Bodie is just like, I mean, there's so many good snowboarders out there. But so the contest thing was just a, I never liked it. I didn't like training for it because you had to spend time in the park. Um, I liked winning it. I liked doing well. And, and I didn't care if I got first, second, or third, just as long as I was on the podium because it's so subjective anyway. It didn't really. And that mother effer, Todd Richards. When people ask me if it's harder for people now to compete, like, yeah, the tricks are harder, but when you're competing with a guy who never falls, like Todd doesn't fall. So he was, it was, he was always there. And like Peter, you knew Peter was going to do something new. So like, yeah, it, it was as hard as it got back then. I mean, I don't know if it's harder now. I'm sure it's harder now, but it, it was relative. You're competing with guy, you know, you're looking at the lineup and like JP's back there wondering if he's going to do the contest and like, you got all these like legendary dude, these 10 dudes just like, whoa, man, I'm competing against these guys. Like that's heavy. So the short answer is it allowed me to do things that, that I wanted to do in snowboarding and it and allowed me to do things to not work in the summer or, or to concentrate on these big, bigger projects. Um, the biggest accolade I think, and at the time it didn't really hit me that much it was just another thing and he put it on the stack and and it was what we what are we doing next there was never time to enjoy or relish an accomplishment and you almost felt like you didn't want to i didn't want to go there in my mind space because that meant you were like your focus wasn't where it was it was never pat yourself on the back it was always like that one little hand pat i did on that jump you know it's like that video part that you film it's never right the great web chasing the dragon. Yeah, chasing the dragon. Totally, it's the photo. Like you never got a photo that you're just like, that's the perfect photo. I never have to take another one. It just doesn't work like that. Yeah, LeBlanc once said, once you have the perfect video part, you basically should retire. Yeah, you're done. Because you're done. You're done. But um, the one thing I can look back on and that I'm, that I'm proud of that that I did correctly that rewards hard work was the writer of the year for three years in a row. Cause I wasn't even going after that. It wasn't a, a th- there was no way that I was going to be writer of the year. That just, that, that didn't even comp. I, I had no, that wasn't even on the radar. The first year I'm like, okay, fluke, whatever. But then it kept going mm-hmm. to the third year. And that the beauty of that and the beauty of it still to this day is it's, it's, it's by a select group of your peers. That's what was important to that about that for me was it's your bro it's your guys out in the trenches with you that are voting on that not not and that not to discredit the public you know the, then the public one it's cool too but when you're peer the guys that are you know in the boat with you that that means a lot as i get older you know 
because at the time I don't, it just went by. Just and win three in a row. That I mean, really, what that that award is as well is it's simply saying you are the best snowboarder in the world, voted by your peers. Yeah, the best in the world are saying you're the best in the world. Yeah, pretty. It's incredible. heavy. Yeah, yeah, and three. Woo, in a row. Now I know you've been talking about how, um, you know, the people we don't want to talk about Bisque, and uh, you can you, you can dodge this if you want. But I know we have a Patreon question from none other than Johan, right? Yep, Johan Malkowski. Mm-hmm. The legend, the this, myth. This is a little bit of a multi multi question here. Please define what a mellow lecti is, <laughs> and how much Bisque you were clearing at your peak. And if you could go back in time and do something differently with your career, what would you do? Damn, that's a three-parter. <laughs> three-parter <laughs> Patreon question. Uh, the mellow lecti. Okay. Well, so the, the to address your first – hi, Johan. The first part of your question <laughs> is the mellow lecti. There used to be this – in the North Wave boots, there was this thing in the bottom, right? And it, and it was like a piece of plastic. went like this, and, of course, it had the lace on it. So what did I do with – these things that this added junk that came in the boot, right? I took it out, took the laces off, and it happened to be that it was a perfect mask. Oh, yeah, I seen that. <laughs> in, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, Kevolution has a the shot of it. You're you're like so this oh, mask, beer through it, yeah. <laughs> this mask came with me everywhere. I it, it was in, it lived in my board bag, and me, you know we'd be sitting around drinking beer. Everybody's bored, and Melolecti would come out. And it was Melolecti. <laughs> So I mean, this persona, you know, stupid things you do when you're a kid and you're bored. And then it kind of, it caught on to mellow lecti. I mean, um, LeBlanc to this day, lecti, like my nickname's lecti, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, kind of a, a, a silence of the lambs kind of a thing. So yeah, some stupid part that morphed into the lecti. <laughs> um, things you could do different. I mean, that's a, anybody in life has things that they could do differently. If I had to pick one, it would. I, it just it wouldn't have got me to the place I am today. So, it, the lessons that you learn are valuable when you screw up, and I screwed up plenty. That makes me better today. So I, I don't think that I would change a whole lot. I mean, you could what, what you could invest your money better. You could, but I'm here today. And if if you still had millions of dollars in the bank, would you would you have the motivation to continue on? And and would I still have this fire to be out there learning this whole? new part of snowboarding and learning how that fits is in my age group and learning what I can get away with, with my body, what I can't, what, how can I be in this snowboarding game still? That's worth more to me than anything. Those lessons that I've learned are worth more to me than any sort of thing that I would do different or to being right where I am right now is, is where I want to be. So I, I don't think that I would change anything because it wouldn't, I wouldn't be, who I was today. There's definitely, and don't get me wrong, there's definitely things that I feel bad about and the way I treated people maybe that, you know, when you're high on your horse and you've had enough and you, you say stupid stuff and, you know, stuff you don't mean. and But you're in it, you know? It's like, what do you do? Stupid things. <laughs> Whatever you've been through made you who you are today, you know? And, yeah. Great I, outlook. Yeah. Um, I, was there another part of his question? It was, <laughs> the yeah. one you're trying to dodge, maybe. I don't know. Oh, oh, with the with the biskies. <laughs> trying to throw a Louis Vito at us. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. There there was a lot of money. I mean, there was there was a lot of zeros in the bank account, and there there was a lot of money spent um, on things that might not have been. I wasn't really a, a too extravagant of a guy. I mean, I bought an Audi. My my extravagance was I bought an Audi and I had it for a year, and then I sold it to Gunny. Cause I was like, this is stupid. I got, t I never had a speeding ticket. And then I got two speeding tickets in like a week. Yeah. And Audis like, do that. <laughs> and I'm like, this is for what to look cool. And then I was always worried about it. And my, my truck, I was never worried about it, you know? So, but Gunny got, you know, I think he took over the payment. I don't remember exactly how the deal went, but he got a nice car out of it or his wife did. And, uh, yeah, there was a lot of money to be made. I mean, when you have at the height, I mean, there was like an action figure and like keychains and baseball cards and, and, and video games, did I say video games already? But your your in sponsor in industry sponsors, your I mean there was there was millions floating around and and if you're at the top of your game, you're gonna be making quite a bit of money. 
And, you know, it's also kind of wild. This is before energy drinks, too. That's another random thing. That's true. Yeah, we never, we, we had a, we were going after Coors for a while, and it came down to it, and it was a very, very, very good deal. <laughs> Plus, I really liked beer back then. <laughs> So I was all in with this thing, and they the demographic hadn't switched yet. There there wasn't enough older people they deemed that that they could get away with it through the through the feds. So, so the beer sponsor, you know, as snowboarding grew, now the demographic is you know they can prove that there's enough people over age that that do it, but at that time they couldn't they couldn't prove that. So most money made in a calendar year. Let's go. A lot. <laughs> Matrix. Uh, right. does it does. What's you know? What's a lot of money to you? A million? Yeah, we we did that. It's it's all relative, you know. If, if you're making enough money to do what you want to do, and it, basically for me, it's a it, more money beca- just came more problems. It was it's actually a rap song. Yeah, that Biggie, goes, Biggie Smalls. More money, more problems. More money, more problems. It wasn't. I mean, you bought. You, you would go. I remember times going out to dinner, and there'd be like a nine of your friends, and nobody even put their their card down. You know, you just when you're just out on like a friendly yeah. dinner, it's not a business dinner. Yeah, or or only like only a couple people would. They or, just expect you to pay. Cause and it was like this: you're is, Kevin Jones, you're making over a million dollars. Yeah, and I never told anybody how much I was making, and the, the, I didn't hit that mark often. And I don't, I don't know if technically it was like that exact number. Yeah, but there was a couple of biscuits flowing in. There was in. there was a lot of you know I had three houses paid for, and you know I didn't have. I didn't have to worry about money for a while. Let's put it that way. But the the excess led to more problems. I think that was worth. I think there's just a there's like a perfect amount of money to have, and that's that's personal. That's like w- what do you want to get out of this life? Or how, how do you want to be? I don't want to be a money guy. Like I have to talk to my financial guy. I'm like I don't even want to talk to this dude. Like, I was that's reading your job. An, an article recently that the people that make seventy five thousand dollars are like the happiest people. Because it's just like this perfect amount of money to live a good life, but not too good of a life, mm-hmm. to get in trouble and mm-hmm. get in over their head. And it still means something when you yeah. slide the card or when you, you know, nobody pays cash anymore, but you st- it still hurts a little bit. You yeah. Know? It's just I, that, that salary is like a, a an all right to be happy and have a family and buy what you need. And Yeah. I think there's, tr- I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. There, there's an interesting study, too, along the lines of that where basically – Talking about money, buying happiness, right? And to an extent, if you're dead broke and you have no money, and you're homeless, and you get some money, you're you're out of you. You don't have to be homeless anymore. So, therefore, you're you have a warm house. You're you have some food. Money is literally buying happiness. If you have zero dollars in your bank account, you can't feed yourself or take or give yourself a housing situation. So, like that zero to like, you know, twenty thousand or ten thousand dollars a year, whatever that is. That 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 Literally, money does buy happiness from that standpoint. But then, once you get up past, like we, I think it was uh, the this statistic was yeah. sixty, but it was older. 60. So probably now the things cost more. It could have gone up with uh, inflation. But you know, th- from seventy five to a million to two million to twenty million doesn't the happiness doesn't change at all on a on a level that was studied, fucking scientifically, whatever that means. But I just thought that was an interesting observation. Your life just gets more confusing, bro. Like a measurable piece of happiness isn't. It, it doesn't register. Yes. Like it's just, it's like you're either content, which isn't a bad word. Content. Is, I love being content. Yeah. Content's like, awesome. Quiet right? or. Yeah. So. I have, I, I always have a question about this too, because I feel like all the greats, they have, they have something kind of chasing them, right? Like is, if you look at, if you look at, if you were just content your whole career, you wouldn't go fucking film two video parts, win X Games. Right? I'm just talking content financially. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah, no, this exactly. is totally different. This is this is a different type of content. This isn't like uh, this is what makes people great. Yeah, like uh, yeah, exactly. Great, More of what by the average. I guess. Yeah, what makes people great? When you look at like my theory has always been like if Michael Jordan did a whole bunch of therapy and he was just like totally like no, I'm good, dude. Like I'm kind of zen. I personally don't think we'd have the same Michael Jordan we have today. I think he has some he has something chasing him that's like, you know, some type of whatever it's a demon or something to prove or some type of there's something in him that's driving him that that I think comes from a little bit of discontent and that doesn't mean financial discontent but some type of like discontent or or like father figure you got to prove not to get all fucking like therapy guy on him but I I wonder do you feel like you because know, because otherwise you'd be like well we got we got 20th place. That's good enough. I'm con- I'm content. Like I'm okay. Or I'm okay. one video part. Yeah, right. Nobody gets two mm-hmm. video so, parts. So, so do you <laughs> do you feel like you were 
you had any anything like that driving you? Absolutely. One was to work hard, take advantage of your. It's multi, you know, there's there's a lot of faces to this. Um, one of them is take advantage of your opportunities that these people are giving you, and then you have to have the work ethic to do that. And then you have to be. There's probably a lot of luck involved. You have to have something, you know, above just naturally kind of talented, which won't get you far if you don't have the other two and vice versa. Uh, and then you got to have a little bit of some, uh, like a screw loose up there. You got to have like this, this all or nothing. Uh, am I willing to die for this? I mean, there's, there's lines that I've got on Alaska that it's, or in Tahoe for that matter, that you, you make that choice. You can only be so safe. It's like, is this willing to die? Am I willing to die for this? Which is a choice you make every morning when you put your keys in your ignition too. Is, is driving my car worth? Yes, it is because I need to drive. It, it's it's kind of no different in, in, a, in the brain of a, of a, I would say, most um, top snow sports athletes. Um, you've made that decision that, that within reason you're, you're willing to make that sacrifice. Um, and that can morph throughout, your, obviously through your career and age and youth. And, and then there's the ego part, you know, the, the easy answer would be the ego. I think people that really don't understand what you're trying to do, what you're trying to build the community, the, the stoke, the, and then there's the other part of that is, is simply the freaking endorphins that run through your brain, dude. It's nothing short of, I have, I've never done heroin, but I would imagine that like, or, you know, I've done some speed. I mean, it's all those. And I mean, it's just like, give me that. And that's a huge component of it too. You, you, the party never stops. You want to go as fast and hard as you can and get the clips and do all these things, check all these boxes throughout the day. And then you're going to end the day. You don't want it to end. You're going to end the day partying, you know, maybe not partying all night. You want to have that fine line between where you can get up in the morning and do it again. And you want that to go forever. Um, so there's that part of it too. You know, there's, there's definitely like a, uh, I, I call it the blessing and the curse. It never goes away. It doesn't go away ever. Still to this day where I'm thinking about a line, you're driving up 395 from Mammoth to from Lone Pine to Reno. And you're just, my, I mean, I'm in the other lane sometimes like, Whoa, I'm like, what about that line? Mm -hmm. What about that? One? You know, I can camp there. I can do this. I can do that. That, that for me is a, is a long, it, it, it cannot be put down. Like I've tried to put it down. I've tried to, you know, start a fly fishing company and like, okay, I can time to grow up. It doesn't, it just doesn't work for me, you know? And I think there's, there's people out there that have this, this thing in their brain that just will not let them stop. And I, I think I'm in that category and it doesn't matter if you're being paid or not, or, or it's like, you're going to take that with you in, in every part of your life or, or you're going to be content with doing whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's fine too, but it's definitely kind of a demon that, like you're saying, that that chases you around and keeps you up at night. You wake up and you go, "Oh man, what if you did like a triple backflip, late back?" Or you're, is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Am I too old? Yeah, probably. So you know, like the, just like the conversations you have mm -hmm. with yourself are crazy. You know, like you're borderline. You, there's de like when I said screw loose, like you. There's definitely something up there that doesn't make sense. And especially doesn't make sense to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To, no, not normal people. It's not normal. You're the civilian. Yeah, that, it doesn't, that was part of the whole, in your snowboarding career, you couldn't talk to people. Like, they'd be like, like dude, I don't want to go to Japan tomorrow. Like, it sucks. I, I want to be here snowboarding. I want to be doing my, I want to be getting better at snowboarding. I want to be like my hair on fire, going a thousand miles in it, you know. And people just look at you like, dude, that dude's a freaking entitled, you know, the guy that I'm talking, don't be. Like, you're, you're a spoiled brat, you know. It, it doesn't really have to do with being spoiled. Most of these snowboarder guys, most of these high-end athletes are the most insecure people you ever meet when it comes down to it. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe you're, you're making up for something in that department. And to generalize it would be stupid, too, because everybody's so individual and unique. But I think that might be part of my deal, you know. And you need to find those endorphins again, I imagine, right? You have to, whether it's rock climbing, whether it's skateboarding, whether it's uh, snowboarding, all that stuff, man. 
once you've discovered them, you need them. And yeah. it's the bros. It's the camaraderie. Yeah. It's like you're going out with your bro the and you're doing something and you're like, you're waking up early and you're buzzed up on coffee. You know, it's like another fucking, it's like, all right, I, I love it. It's like just the same shit, you know, like whether it's a new sport or new thing, but you, you get a taste and you're like chasing the dragon again. Totally. Like whether it's dirt bike or rock bike, for you, yeah. rock climbing, like <laughs> uh, yeah, you're fucking, you're just like, well, that was pretty good. What if I did this a little bit bigger? Like, it's like fucking, I front boarded uh, this rail. Let's why not a, a double kink or why not? The, whatever, you know, it's like totally fucking just this never ending, like clip junkie or fucking chasing the dragon, chasing the dragon, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, everybody gets it in their own way, you know? Can't wait to get up the hill on Saturday, you know? It's like snowed three inches. Like, you're watching the weather, and you're just like, ah. Mm -hmm. yeah. then, uh, another thing, too, along these lines, what you were talking about is experiencing extremely high highs. And and, and kind of, like, what goes up must come down, you know? And and just that part of, of your life, too. And, and still, I'm sure it's, you still experience it, but the, you know, rider of the year, video winning X Games, video parts. It, it's like the fucking... You're doing a fucking 900 over here, a 1080 over here. Every day you're just like, you're going, right? It's, you're in it. You're in it. It was moving so fast you couldn't even, you couldn't even fucking have time to think about the fact that you're in it because you're like, I did a, I just won this contest. Now I'm going on to Alaska. What, however, it seems like you were just pinned and I can only imagine that the, the endorphin levels, the highs you're experiencing are so goddamn high. And, and does that come with a crash, a low that match it? Absolutely. And it's equal to the high. Life has a funny way of doing that to you. Life has a funny way the older you get. It's going to happen. Like, be on the lookout because you're, you're going to get kicked. And for me, the formula got repetitious. It was, what am I going to do? Another video part? And then I'm like, okay, well, let's make a movie. You know, then we did Kevolution, and I was like, well, there's so many moving parts to this movie, and I wanted to do a two-year, and I couldn't. And it... And uh, shout out to uh, uh, Enoch Harris, who, who uh, really uh, got that thing rolling. Um, and all the guys at Bill Long, for that matter, Graham. And, but, um, yeah, so it became like, what are you going to do next? It became like, well, we, I don't want to just go film a video part. And you, maybe you're getting a little comfy with this money in the bank. And then, and I always wanted a family. I always wanted, and so I, oh, I want that. So I got married and got divorced a couple of years later. Big financial hit, getting married. Don't get married in Oregon. Um, which the, and who cares? It's money. You can make money again. Um, but it was about my, my daughter Ella's involved, you know, so that, that, that was kind of happened. Genius happened where they sold it. Me and Steve Aspen were, were bickering about things. Um, who, for the listeners, who's my agent, we, we started the, the family, which was a, an agency for snowboarders. Um, and yeah, BMX dude, it eventually turned into, you know, all these quote unquote, lack of a better term, action sports. Uh, because it started as he was my team manager at Lamar, and I just needed my bills paid. I was tired of paying the 35 bucks every time I was late, and my account would be, you know, hey, put some money in my account. I, I wanted a guy, I wanted a, a dude in my pit crew. Hey, dude, put some money in my account. I'm, I'm, I'm in freaking France, and I don't have, like, my car doesn't work, you know. Like, I, need, I needed a guy, and he was that guy, and he was really good at it. And, but we, we kind of started bickering a little bit over what I was going through. Like, I, there's no, you know, I think in snowboarding, responsible people that are involved that are close to these athletes, how's your mental health doing? How, how are you doing up there? Like, like, um, are you, are you doing all right? Besides, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Like, no, like, seriously, like, are you, like, sit down and be honest. Like, are you, I noticed you've been drinking. Like, every shop tour you've been on, you've been blackout drunk. Like, are you okay? No, I'm not, dude. I'm freaking, like, all this, per it gives me chills. All this personal stuff's going on. I have all these obligations. I don't want to be there. And, yes, I, I basically don't remember the last three weeks of my life because I've been on the road promoting these products that have my name on them. It's like, and you, you feel even those words coming out of my mouth, I feel like a spoiled little brat. But at the time, that's what was going on in my mind. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I did everything I want to do. My, 
my marriage didn't work because largely because I wasn't there. Just that's the nut kicking was it all nut kicked me at the same time. Right. So then you, it takes time for, to figure out where you are. Like, what, what are you going to do? You already did all this stuff. And so you could stop and people be like, you can stop right now. You did it. I'm like, no, that doesn't, the demon's still going. He's still like, dude, you need a clip. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's going to feel good. You know, (laughs) it's like the monkey on your back. He's like, Hey dude. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) Hey, you could back lift that rail. You know, like, Hey, go up to Haynes, Alaska. Um, but that wasn't the, the issue. But then you get so, sp- and you're up there, you're, you're doing your job and, and you're thinking about all these other things, you know, like divorce lawyers. And, like, and, and you're fighting, and you start kind of fighting with your friends because you're not right, you know? And I think that people need to be more aware of that. We didn't have that back then. It was more of a man like, oh, you, you're not going to do your job. You're quick. You're done. You're already old anyway. You're 32 years old, you know, whatever the age I was. But th- there was no... There was no long-term plan for any, any of these athletes. There was no, like, you can go till you're 50, which is my goal now. I want to I wanna go hard till I'm 50. And then, then, then that whole scale moves. Then people are like, there's room to, to have a mental breakdown. There's room to, hey, dude, this dude needs to go to rehab. This dude's, like, messed up. Like, his brain is, is, is like, he's gone, dude. I haven't seen him sober in a year. Like, send him off. He can come back better than he ever was before. Mm-hmm. And have that be okay. Have that be yeah, okay. And they'll still support you. And they'll still support you. Maybe you know, and whatever that looks like, who cares? Um, support you being there, mm-hmm. most importantly. And you know, so this guy doesn't put a bullet in his head, mm-hmm. or you know, there need that's that community thing. Like we're we're expanding this community, and being like, hey, dude, we need to talk about these things. Not just oh, your checks yeah. are gone, and I'm not going to call you. I mean, my phone went silent from like you would look at the phone and there'd be 50 text messages at the end of the day on there. And, and it just went like cold and I'm going, and then you're going through and it, it was like a macho thing. It was more of a macho, like I can do it, you know, but you just end up in a deeper hole if you don't have any, any help. So I just went into a hole for a while and I had to ask myself, what is snowboarding to me? You know, I had to go seek professionals and be like, dude, what was wrong with me? And they're like, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, this is, we've seen this a million times. Like, this is, this is what you're going through. Here's what you got to do. Um, and it was like, well, so I'm not crazy. You know, like, no, you're not crazy at all. You just, you just have to take these, do these couple things. Talk about it more. Oh, okay. So then you start feeling better. Then you get, then you can kind of reinvent, you kind of reprogram your brain into what, what you want to do. Like, and one, one of my counselors asked me one time, they said, do you even want to snowboard anymore? And I couldn't, I was programmed to say, yeah, of course. But I was like, do I? So I went camping in Mammoth for 40 days in the middle of a winter. Didn't even, didn't, no, inter, no Instagram, no nothing. I'm like, do I like this? Grabbed my split board and just went and camped. Like, asked myself all the hard questions. And, and I came out of it going, hell yeah, you love to snow. If you can go snowboarding by yourself and have the time of your life and you're just with yourself and you're, and you're comfortable enough with yourself to ask yourself the hard questions and figure out what you're about and what you want to be, I mean, that's why, like, do I take any of that? When you ask the question, do I take anything back? Hell no, because I'm stoked where I'm at right now. I'm stoked who I am, who I've become. Without that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had to ask the hard questions and what's important. Yeah. So, yeah, the fall, the, the fall and, and those, the fall, it, you're not just, not to paint too pretty of a picture of the, the fall and then you get up and, you know, everybody loves Seabiscuit at the end where the horse wins, wins the race. You know, <laughs> I cry at the end of that movie every day. I watch about once a year. But, that's the, you're still going to have, you know, bumps in the road and stuff, but then you get, you get kind of some tools to manage it. You know, you get, you get these things that, that help you get through the day where you don't have to end up like either self-sabotaging yourself or, or, you know, the worst is to, to take your life. You know, there's been a lot of that going on and that's unacceptable in our community. I think we need to take care of ourselves, take care of our peeps. You were the first super pro. So maybe nobody knew what it looked like after your career ended. No, nobody you had to go through it, you know. Yeah, nobody. And and if I can help somebody, you know, phone's open, dude. Call me up. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're in that position and you don't know where to go, what to do? I mean, I've been there, man. It's a dark, you know. It's a dark. It's like the dust bowl, dude. Like, 
you mowed down all the grass and you made all your money and you know and then all of a sudden this big old dark cloud comes through and when that when you're in that dark cloud you, you can't see anything you yeah, can't you, you can tell people oh you're, everything's gonna be fine and you don't hear, nobody hears that when they're no, that, you can't hear it you're, you're like i can't even decide what to have for lunch dude like and, and i'm not hungry but i know i should eat like there's no like there's got to be some uh not just milk these kids for financial gain to, to sell some pieces of plastic. There's, there's emotions and real, real people involved, you know. Yeah, Red Bull has mental health coaches. I wish more brands had that because there's a lot of, not everyone rides for Red Bull. So Yeah, totally. I also love what you were talking about earlier. I don't love this, but I want to get into the kind of, you basically did like a little vision quest, found some stillness, but it seems like in your era, especially at just that time period, not in snowboarding, just in life, especially males, you got some feelings, you got some emotions, take those things, fucking just oh, shove yeah. them down. Don't have, don't bring them up. Do not bring those feelings up. You're, you're yeah. t- don't show mm-hmm. weakness because you're a man, right? So that's, and that's luckily changing with time. Like people are realizing like, okay, it's okay to feel fucking sad. It's okay to feel depressed. That's that people, humans are fucking wired to feel that way in a lot of senses, especially with modern day society. But I love that how you basically are like, I'm going to, you didn't maybe say this, but you've took some time to find stillness. And there's some famous quote, I forget who it is, but you know, all of man's problems stems from his inability to sit in a room alone by himself. And I feel like that, you know, I want to learn, I want to know more about what went through your mind when you were doing those 40 days. Like that, that experience fascinates me is how you found yourself and like the effect that had on you. Well, one, it was the demon. The demon's like, Hey, you need to learn every single thing you can learn about winter camping. There's only one way to do that because it sucks and you can't just go to the store and, and grab something and you got to figure out all the little nuances and, and how many ways can I use a boot lace to, you know, the weight and the, so that was, that was partly the demon trying to get me out there to like, Oh, you know, you can, you can do this because it gets to the point where you're like, I, I see these things over here you know, like what, Jeremy Jones did. He like he's like I see things the the big mountain Jeremy. I see things over here that I can't. How do I get there? You know, and then you just get the. It's another fascinating part of snowboarding is figuring out all the logistics and it's got all the pieces. It's got the camaraderie, it's got the technical ability. It's got okay. You're watching the studying the weather and the avalanche. It's got all those pieces and you get to mix them all up and figure out where they fit to get that you know to put paint your picture on the mountain. Um, just another aspect of snowboarding that I'm totally fascinated with just a, a lot of those a lot of that time was spent like on a on a skin track you know like you, with split boarding you have a lot of time to think and I, I think it's really good for you to just think by yourself I had to I've been like you said I had been pushing all these emotions and expected to be some guy that that's half drunk and funny for 15 years you know however many years and you can't, like, I'm in a sh- crappy mood. I don't want to be here, but I got to go out and do this movie premiere or whatever it is. You, you push all that stuff aside and you go put on the act. You put the clown face on it. And, and you know that you have a responsibility to these people that they're stoked to see you. I mean, they're, I would be stoked if I, you know, it'd be like freaking Jamie Thomas walked in the room. I'd be like, hey, whoa, dude, like heavy. And what, he's going to be a jerk to me? And I'll be like, that guy's an asshole. That's not how it works, you know? So it's just, I just thought about all, everything. You have time, you know, I wanted to make sure it was enough time. And it wasn't that I set out for 40 days. I just ended up, I kept going back into town, getting supplies and coming back out. And, and uh, didn't even bring a car. <laughs> it was, I, I was committed to figuring out what was going on in my brain. You talk to yourself a lot out there? A lot. And I got like a lot of ravens, you know, like me and ravens are pretty tight. <laughs> Talk to the ravens. Well, they, they would come the same day. I started leaving food out for yeah. them and they would come and it was the same dudes and they would have like these different sounds, you know, they have like 75 or something document, whatever it is, but they would come out and they'd be like, there'd be like a low, you know, chirping. And then, be, so I, you know, you're, you have nothing else better to do. I'm like, is this, are they like, is this their mood? Are they like hungry? Are they trying to communicate? They, yeah, what are they your saying? brain just starts going. <laughs> they, you are, know? they actually are doing all those things. Yeah. yeah. And then they would thieve things like, like they would kind of steal stuff out of my camp, like, and, and like put them 
not like hide them or take them back. Like they'd be like just shit wouldn't be moved. They'd move stuff around. Yeah, and I'm like, am I like bros with these dudes or yeah? So that I mean, it's it was cool. It was it was real. I highly recommend it actually. Mm-hmm. Just doing something, whether that's even a night or a day, or go spend some time in the mountains. And there's a reason, like, in all, in all religious lore and whether or not you believe in any of this stuff or not. But over a history of time, people go to the mountains, you know, the Ten Commandments and Moses. And yeah. people go to the mountains to have these, like, visions, you know. They, they, they haven't had a scientific reason probably yet besides the trees give off, off, you know, whatever it is. But there's something to it, you know. Everybody, not everybody, but I think a lot of people feel that. They're healing, healing places. When did you do this? This was 2003. This time was like 15, I believe, sometime around there. Mm-hmm. Now, I heard you say recently earlier today, you, you're you like, I haven't been hungover in two years. And I know that you like partied through your snowboard career. You show up at these premieres. You got to be throwing back beers. You got to go fucking get flown to Japan 20 times. Like you, you show up and people got a case of beer and a pizza for you. And... Drinking's part of the culture, and I know um, it seems like you kind of battled it. And, and you know, what what is your relationship with alcohol? What did it look like? <laughs> like, was it bad before, and where where are you at with it now? Yeah, it got pretty bad. Um, it became it first. It was just keeping the party going. You know, it's like in the culture, and I think that that's getting better. I think it's more accepted now that if you don't want to participate in certain activities, and I'm sure in a lot of ways it's gotten worse. I'm sure there's probably other drugs involved, and you know, youth with money is. You know, in time, it, it's it doesn't matter if you're a snowboarder or college or you know that that stuff's going to happen. I think it's when it becomes a problem is you got to be pretty open with yourself. Is when you you start using that as medicating for something, you're you're compensating for. I don't I don't I don't feel right, and you don't know that it's not all right to feel all not. <laughs> you don't know that it's not. You don't know that it's all right to not feel all right. Yeah, you don't know that. You just think something's wrong. I don't know how to work through that. No, it's not wrong anymore. But then you feel up in the mo- you wake up in the morning and it's worse. So you go about your day and you then you you just kind of repeat this cycle of uh, lack of a better word, self medicating. And I and it worked for me. Like alcohol is great for that. Alcohol worked for me for a lot of years. It it you know long plane flights by yourself and um you know get to it's your reward. You get to your hotel room and you and you you got a couple tall boys and you drown them. You go to sleep. You wake up. You go snowboarding. It, it wasn't a problem until it was. Nobody wakes up in the morning one day and goes, hey, you know what? I want to I want to piss people off and maybe go to jail and, and like look myself in the mirror and go, dude, you got some serious problems with alcohol. You don't, you don't ever do that, you know? All you ever hear, all, all it is is like, oh, if you get that, you go deal with it, you know? For me, it was just something that I had to look at very closely, and I was never the like I, I can never drink again guy. I, my brain couldn't. My brain wouldn't let me go to that that spot. You know, it couldn't be like, hey, you can never have a beer again. My brain would be like, whoa, dude. My other monkey. I got the demon, the snowboard demon over here, and then that's like the alcohol demon over here. And it's like, no, I, I, that's not flying over here. You know, hey, <laughs> wait, wait a second. You know, yeah, we're not okay with that over here. So it was, it, it yeah, it was just something I had to get a, and it wasn't like. It was something I tried at first, which cemented my idea that, hey, this isn't good for me. I, I go a week, and then next thing you know, like, you drank for, like, three days or something. I'm like, that ain't cool. Now I feel like crap. Like, so it was, like, a process of learning that that stuff doesn't really, it doesn't work for me anymore like it used to, which is fine. But it's hard is the thing, as you know. Drugs and alcohol, are the, they work, so... They numb pain. They, they're really good at making you hide what you really want to deal with. And that's why they're so hard to quit. So just my recommendation would be, you know, just check yourself every once in a while. If you can't stop for a year, then maybe you should look at yourself. Or if you can't stop for a week, or you know, nothing good comes out of it, really. Jail time. And, but, man, the good times. <sighs> But I got all those, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that you're only allowed so many drunks in your, mm-hmm. in your life that, you, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that's 3000 for you, or maybe that's 8,000 for me or, you know, whatever the number is. So you max out. My, you dad, ma- my dad calls it a quota. Quota. Yeah. You yeah, got, you, you got your quota. My quota happened fast because, you know, I drank basically every day 
whether that was a beer or two or 20, it didn't, I didn't really get into hard alcohol, but I love my beer. But that's cool. I can look back and think about all the times I jumped on the table and peed on myself and be like, I don't need to do that again. You know? mm-hmm. It's like an old video part. Been I'm, there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who's been everywhere and seen everything. Yep. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Um, all right. Well, beautiful, dude. I'm glad we, we touched on that. I think it's important for people mm-hmm. to hear. And, and a lot, everybody has their struggles, you know, and, and that's fucking human nature. And it's, it's, cool, it's cool to know that people's fucking glorious people they idolize have the same struggles they do. You know, I do. I still do. You know, so. Um, yeah, let it be said that it, it's, it's never over. Yeah. It, it all, it, it, it'll creep up on you. Mm-hmm. And a lot, a lot of that too came with, there was a lot of grief, you know, I, I, uh, Danny Cass's microdose, he says, you know, if you're going to be a snowboarder, there's going to be a lot of pain, something to that effect. And just the sheer amount of deaths that were going on, um, I could probably run a, a short list right now, but like Jeffy Anderson hit hard, Craig Kelly in the same year, Andreas Franson, J.P. Claire, which are skiers, but they they were very much part of the, what I wanted to be doing and people that I had run into. And um, Christian Cabanilla was a guy that I was going to start a heli operation with in Alaska. Um, actually went up, stayed at his property, and we were doing the construction on this, on our helipad. You know, like, we can stay in tents the first year. Like, he dies in an avalanche in Haynes. Aaron Caritas, a guide in Alaska f- with me for many years, died in the same canyon as Christian did a year later on almost the exact same day. And he was also my neighbor in, in Bend when I lived in Bend for a while. It's, it gets really close, you know, and if you don't properly grieve these people, Jamil Khan was, was, was one of the first times I experienced that. We went up to Donner Summit, me and Dave Hatchett, and like looked at the site and like, just like, oh my God. Like, it was really heavy. That was the first time it was real. And, and there's been countless others, and I can't really recall them off the top of, of my head. Um, but so there was a lot of, of putting that in, and, and you have to put that somewhere in your brain. And a lot of those guys were really good friends of mine. And like, what's it worth to you? Is it, is it worth it to you? And I came up with the conclusion of yes, you know, be smart, do your thing. Um, Andy Irons was a big one. I was cat. Me and Travis went cat skiing. Travis Rice, I just dropped a name. Went cat skiing with the guy, and he was just so fired up on snowboarding. And and he had I don't know if you've seen that movie that that he that he has out, but it is amazing. I think it's on Netflix. Um, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. It's like something of the gods or. Anyways, Google it. Yeah. That's, so this is all kind of in this in this period of when I was going through all this, so that that had a whole separate compartment of that went, it wasn't, it was separate, but it wasn't, it was all kind of in this stew, this snow globe of emotion and feeling and, and then getting older and like, so yeah, they all had to be put somewhere and it, it's okay to take some time for yourself and go, go put those pieces together, see where you come out. Cause I guarantee it's going to be something better, something better than what you got going on, you know, and respect those people by living your life in a certain way that, that that helps helps people or inspires people or both mm-hmm. you know yeah that can that grief can turn into a lot of different things and um you know i, I think probably m- at most people listening or you know all, everybody here at this table's experienced it and, and it comes out in different ways and people deal with it differently and it's and it's okay so that's also the other thing it's also okay if one one of your friends is at this point in grieving and maybe you know, for one other friend, it's for me, sometimes the, the grief has turned into the fuel where you're like, I got to do it for the people that can't. But it's also you got to be careful because it can turn into fuel that can give you a case of the fuck it's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the case of the fuck it's where you're like, fuck it. Like, I don't care. I'll like, yeah, yeah. you know, and that's also not necessarily you should be aware of that too that's that's this a photo of j2 says it all there's three names of his best friends that passed away and now he's passed away and he's mm-hmm. dumping out of 40 yeah mm-hmm. j2 and, and that yeah. basically tells the story of what you're telling it's snowboarding can give you a lot of pain i guess because we yeah. know so many people is what i think so the average the average circle's a lot smaller maybe maybe yeah and plus what you're doing is pretty 
Well, yeah. on we top of we it. We don't like to yeah. admit it, but on top of it, so yeah. it, it can only be so safe. Yeah, there's gonna uh, it's gonna happen. Yeah, and then Selaznik's battle was pretty huge mm-hmm. with with cancer and drug addiction and uh, basically the drug addiction. I don't even like saying that it was, it was mental illness. He, he, it was in the family, and his snowboarding thing was done, and nobody knew. You know, the most motivated, awesome, talented guy I've ever met in my life, and then he just went. And he went down quick. Just, you know, I don't know how or what, you know, that's maybe something I'll spend more time researching. How do you how do you come out of a career and do it successfully? Yep. Or if, if that's even if that's what you want to do. I don't I never saw myself as coming out of a career. I, I saw myself as snowboarding until I die. You're always living in that moment and it's gonna go on forever, is what you tell yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't want to think about it almost. Yeah. Well, it's conversations like this, right? And also being aware that like your self, your self worth, is not tied to your snowboard tricks or your title. But you know, it's so fucking funny you say that, right? I've been working on that. I've been working on that, right? Like being cognizant. Like my my self worth doesn't repl- my reflection of whether I did a good trick today or not does not make me a good or bad person. Although I'm wired to think that way. But I'll tell you, go, I'll tell I will tell you what I went up snowboarding the other day and had a fucking great day. And it just felt one of those days where it just, it was just clicked in. It happens. It's just, you're yeah. just, it doesn't happen often, but it, like, there's just like, oh, this is, things are working. Came home and like Leah, like, she's just like, what's like, why you are happy like that? That makes you like happier than other things. Like I was on a level that, it, so it, it's hard. It's hard because yeah. I'm going to I'll take that part out of it. That, that doesn't go away. I will still, I will always let it make me happy. But uh, maybe just don't wear the bad days as much or something. I, I don't. That was your first know. day of the year too, huh? Yeah. That's a good start. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like when you don't play pool for like two years and then you, you play somebody at nine ball and you just smoke them right off the bat. Yeah, you just kill it. And then you just like lose all your money. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good day. Know the bad days are around the corner. <laughs> all right, buds. Let's talk about the old bomb hole of the week. The B hole of the week. If the B hole of the week. Today we're talking about Volcom's technology zip tech. Okay, what is ZipTech? ZipTech allows you to connect your jacket and your pants with an easy zipper system in the powder skirt to the top of your pants. Skirt or skort? Skirt. Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> so what what uh, what riders use ZipTech? Uh, Arthur Longo. Okay, yeah, he's a, he's a ringer. Marcus Cleveland. Oh, so it's not just American riders. It actually it's good for works, Scandinavia it works and Europe? In Europe as it well. Does. It's uh, on European time, as Lizard King might say. Okay, perfect. So, are we doing some type of giveaway with this uh, this brand? Yeah, what we want to do is we want to see your best bales, either in the powder, maybe on a handrail, even just catching a snow snake out there. Every ability, I don't care what's going on, people bail. We want to see those bales. Hashtag Volcom Bomb Proof at Volcom Snow at the bomb hole. You're going to get a package from a Volcom picked by a Volcom team rider. If some, you win. If, if you, you win. win. Yeah, the winner picked by the some of the best riders in the world. And uh, they're going to pick their favorite bale, and you're going to get a package with some sweet swag in there from Volcom and the Bomb Hole. And what's the hashtag? Volcom Bomb Proof. Okay, get into it. Okay, well, along the lines of these fallen heroes, I think about, you know, if you're getting a case of the fuck, it's... And the thing that had the least regard for your human safety, the clip that stands out to me, that is probably not the most recognizable for others, but the one where I was like, holy fuck, you could... You could die on that in a relatable, non-Alaskan way. You bomb drop into a chute that has a cliff on the <laughs> exit. Off of a, You bomb drop off of this rock into a chute that has a cliff exit that is an absolute no-fall zone. Absolute no-fall zone. And what, what the fuck were you thinking on that clip, out of curiosity? Well, for one, Bjorn Lannis was there, so... So... <laughs> Bjorn just brings the heat just being there, right? Uh, no, we saw this. Thing. I've been looking at it for years, and it, and it like there's something there, but it was at kind of the top of this like little wind tunnel in South Lake, and, it, and the it always scours the top of that thing, so you could never ride into it. Like it always scoured, like it's like scoured to the rocks, like Eastern Sierra's kind of wind, like so you can't ride into that this double. But I'm like, well, what if I could hike down there and bomb drop that thing? And when I got up there, I'm like, well, there was, a, there was like a flat rock like about this big, like a, like a brick that you could actually like, that what wouldn't move. There's a lot of shale up there and like a lot of the rock wouldn't move, but this thing was like connected to stuff. You know, I dug around and like, this thing's connected. 
we're just going to strap my boards on. Like, you guys get ready. And Reuter was there, I think, and Nathan Yant. Might need an air horn for those dudes. Legend. Um, so I, I just strapped in, and I, and I was like, I'm going to do this. It looks, it looks like as I go. And I kind of stood up, sat back down, and I said, hey, guys, I'm going to do this. And I just, it just felt right. So I, I did it. But, yeah, that was a definite no-fall zone. Like, it wasn't really an option to... The worry, though, was that I was planning on hopefully my, my strategy was that this is all windswept, so this was all going to be wind loaded in there, and I wasn't going to get some volcanic rock that I. And the exit of the thing, you can't tell on the clip, but it kind of did one of these. And then it had like the rock shelf here. Mm -hmm. So you kind of had to. I, I couldn't just go straight, or I would have clipped my nose. I had to kind of go to the side. Um, and I almost landed it. Yeah. The one that got away. But yeah, that was, uh, I think about, that's funny, I think about that thing sometimes. I go, yeah, I'm going to go back there and do that thing. Devil on the shoulder? You know? Because you only could do one try, huh? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I men to, mentally, it was yeah. like, you, you didn't want to, with the track in there, you, yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to, like, that was that where you had to, off the bomb drop part, that's where you had to land, was right there. So um, how many how many video parts total are we looking at, roughly? I don't know. I haven't counted, probably in between 20 and 30 um, if you're counting all the video magazines and that you know Chris Robinson R.I.P. fell into a crevasse over in <laughs> Europe all that stuff like from the beginning yeah there's just there's quite a few there's probably uh, zero that I'm happy with but that's the nature of the the dragon chasing right? the you're dragon. hard on yourself man zero well, well let's talk about the freaking there's the, shots that i'm kind of stoked on there you go but they always have kind of a like one of my favorite shots is the one that he just it's funny you picked that one out and it's a fall but it was like that all in like all in moment yeah um the back lip at the north star rail that one i was happy about that really happy that i did it on my second try I didn't want to fall on those cheese grater stairs. Dude, <laughs> cheese graters. Yeah, North Star Rail was like proving grounds around that point. It was like, oh, you fucking put something up on North Star. That was kind of king of the castle era. It was steep, too. You didn't really want to session it. You just the impact. Yeah, and then they ripped it out, man. I'm like, that, you guys have like a super huge, like, you could just make this like a marketing tool. Like, what do you got on the North Star? You could have kept that thing in there for 10 more years. Yeah, true, huh? Could have been, you know, somebody would have front side boarded it or, you know, 270 did it and back side. I mean, they would have been, they yeah, probably would have knows. been gapping it yeah. now because there was a, like another set up above it and it had like mm -hmm. three stairs down to a, like a 25 foot flat. Mm -hmm. They probably would have set a little. Oh, yeah. Guaranteed. It would have been cool to see the progression on that thing. A little winch over. What about the, um, the kind of later, later in the career, the arc of the career, the, the triple backflip? How did that come about? I, I could, I got, I, like, I had them in my bag. Like, I could do double backflips all the time. But a couple of them, I, I got to, like, in between your first and second, you get a good look, and you just kind of, like, keep going. And I just kept having to slow way down on my second one. And so then that winter went by, and that was, like, I don't know, 2009 or 10 or both. I was doing doubles, and I, it was one of those things in the summertime. I was just sitting around, you know, guiding fly fishing and, like, hanging out in the summer. my demon in my brain wouldn't let me rest and I'm like I think I can do triple and I've always done things in my brain that's something we might want to touch on is I've always yeah a visual very visual um I'll, I'll rehearse things in my mind hundreds of times until I get it perfect because your brain will fight you like if you shut your like if you close your eyes and you try to do a backside 720 your brain tries to like not grab with the right hand or you'll have like a pinky in the air or like your goggles will fly off. Your, your brain is constantly trying to sabotage what you're trying to think about. So I'll get it in my brain to where, and it, it takes a while like, try it. It's, it's, I mean, you probably do it. And I don't know if buds, you imagine your the sequence. In the I, middle, I can still just imagine in the middle of the twists night <laughs> all the time. Still yeah. this day. Same thing. It's like you, you have this mental. So it's basically like you're programming your brain to do it. Right. I'm sure they do it in basketball and everything else. And so you imagine the shot going in, right? Same thing. It's like you just imagine yourself riding away. And you, but you, the, the key for me is to get it right in my brain. 
and my reasoning behind that is my, if my brain can't do it, and it, how's it going to connect to all the moving parts that have to come together? So, so I was just laying in my bed night after night, just thinking, no, I'm, I'm, I think I want to do that, you know. And it, and then we got the right. I I did it on the wrong jump first. Um, wasn't enough air time. And then that jump, it it, it happens. So that was cool. I, I think we've talked about this on the show before, but I find it very interesting. You know, if you're thinking about trying a hard trick or something that's in the back of your mind, if you're in a place of, like, indecision, it's scary. You're like, oh, fuck, like, should I do this? Should I hit this big jump? Should I do a triple backflip? Right? But when you've rehearsed it and you've practiced it in your head and you've accepted, it's not, like, if I'm going to do this, it's I'm going to do this. It doesn't. It becomes less scary. Did you experience that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And that comes with time. That comes with you're giving. It's like giving a dog a freaking treat, right? He sits. He gets the treat. You vision. You envision something in your brain. You go, okay, like the 1080 is another example. It's like, dude, I can do that. I've over rotated tons of nights. I just got to figure out how to. Which was kind of a big deal at the time. And so you just do it in your head a few times and then so you you know you get the treat and you you start to make that part of your routine where you you're getting that treat over and over again and then you have faith in the in the in the in the process so i think you're absolutely right is that you you get to the top and it it it's not something it's not a place you haven't been before you've been there in your mind i that it's helped me a ton if you were to put like a some sort of like how much does it help? I have no idea. But it, if anything, it, 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 it helps me know that at least I landed it in my brain. <laughs> or lines the same way. I'll do the same thing with lines. Toe turn there, little tree, blind rollover, cliff, you know, that sort of stuff. But the real motivation w- behind the triple backflip was I uh, was doing redoing my contract with Billabong and Andrew Mariner. says what do you want to do be a pro snowboarder for the rest of your life and that was enough i'm like oh dude this is, i knew right then i'm like this new, i'm gonna do a new trick it's gonna it, was, go down. it was fueled by spite that's what he said it to was, you, huh? it was fueled i mean it was kind of joking but we were talking about you yeah. know money and bisque and you know i'm worth this you know it was my entitlement so you're gonna go out and prove how many biscuits you were worth so there was yeah there was a little bit of that that i'm gonna I'm going to do it. I'm going to take all the steps. Because I, 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 I couldn't really think of any other tricks that, that it was, was that I could. To do a new trick is a really hard thing. Yeah. Especially at the one uh, quote in a magazine was uh, at the biblical age of 36. Biblical. I was like, biblical. Like, that's <laughs> heavy, dude. Like, I'm like Methuselah, dude. I'm like 967 <laughs> years old. But, yeah, so there was a little spite. You know, those are all things that fuel you. Um, spite boarding. Love spiteboarding. There's this climber guy, Andy Kirkpatrick. He's like, like gnarly dude. Solos, like not solo rope solos, but like aid climbs and like. He said nothing good ever came out of love. You know, it's like your best performances are all you know. You're comfy in love, and you got warm body in your bed. You're like, I ain't gonna go do anything, <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> I ain't, I'm just gonna stay in the warm body. He says all good things come out of hate and spite, and <laughs> he's, he's from England. You know, he's just like, well, you know, Brit. And, Living in there that might, spite. There might be truth to that. You know? I think there is 100%. Yeah, there's some truth. Yeah, there's some stand-up comedians with jokes about that. Okay, we're going to take a quick break to talk to you guys about the Rourke Layover Pant. Now, Rourke makes the original Adventure Pant. It was designed for transit. It has oversized zipper pockets to fit your travel documents and keep them secure. It's got a back phone pocket for convenience. It's got laser perforated back panel for breathability. You get no ass sweat while traveling, buds. You hear that? It sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, definitely overload of ass sweat here on the regs. Gets um, hot in these seats. We need to get some of these pants on. Yeah, we do. It's got a full waistband drawstring, which eliminates the need for a belt. TSA friendly. You just breeze through that line. It's got two-way blended stretch fabric to make them super comfortable, no matter how little leg room you have on the flight. So, KJ, we know you've traveled like a maniac over all these years. A lot of time on an airplane. What is your best layover story? What do you got for us? Well, one of them is I won the X Games, 
and there was a plane full of dudes that uh, we were all at the the bar at the airport, and we all missed our flight, of course. We're sitting literally like here to the lot. We're sitting 15 feet from our gate. How we missed this flight, I have no idea. Like it still baffles me to this day. So then, the, you know, one of those Connecticut freaking, I don't know what you guys call them out there, nor'easters or something. You probably have some. Nor'easter. Nor'easter, that's yeah. right. One of those things comes in and shuts the airport oh, down. For Mount like, Snow X Games. Like five days, you know, however long. It, it, of course, it was probably only two days, but now the story is morphed into five. So now we're just stuck in this town, like, for days. So that's, that's a pretty fun. And guess what we did, you know? We couldn't drive anywhere. There was no hitting. Ra- like, the, the city was shut down. Like, the freeway outside of our hotel room was, like, three feet of power on it, you know? Like, there's only so many things we could get to around our hotel room to even snowboard. And so that's a pretty funny one, just, like, if we just would have gone on that flight. Um, my best, it's not fun. There's no, like, rad drinking story involved. Is I was in New Zealand. I was there for, like, a month, and I was I was at the airport. I'm like, I never get to do anything on these trips but snowboard. I never see anything. I, I, I don't go to Europe and go to museums and stuff. Like, I've never been to, like, the Coliseum or anything. I'm like, I'm just going to stay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, like, literally, like, Eddie Walling in the – in the airport, I'm like, I got my bags, you know. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to stay. Okay, went and got a cab and got this uh, bitchin' hotel at the, like, tippy top overlooking Christchurch in New Zealand. And there's a skate park within, I could skate to the skate park and just cruise around, went into these, all these awesome, they have, like, this badass church with, like, gargoyles and stuff on it. And, like, tripped out on all the you know, found a night, like a little coffee spot and like my restaurant. And I was just totally solo for like a week, just cruising around Christchurch and skateboarding. And that was like the best layover because it was like a week long and it was planned and it was just, you know, you got to do those things every once in a while. People mm-hmm. forget to do those things. Like yeah. a vacation for me during, you know, for years and years and years was going home. Like the last thing I wanted to do is get back on an airplane and go anywhere. Yeah. I was like, catch up with friends and, hang out with my family and so I actually took some time and did my thing that was that was killer yeah I think I read in one of your interviews last night that you didn't go home for Christmas for like 10 years or something I did it was forever yeah Yeah. (laughs) or Thanksgiving or just I would try it just it just wouldn't work and then that you know that of course it always storms around you know so it's like is it It doesn't snow in Tahoe anymore so you don't have to even worry about it right 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 it's snowing on the way out I well, hope that changes. I'll tell you what. I think we should maybe get into a little hot takes. Yes. Uh, you probably knew this was coming, or maybe not, but we always like to ask who the greatest of all time in snowboarding is. You know, GOAT, uh, maybe Michael Jordan is the reference. Uh, we like to do male and female here. Uh, who do you have for the GOATs? The greatest of all time for me is Noah Selaznik. For male... And I'm a little jaded, I got to watch, but he, he encompassed everything that was for a snowboarder to me. It, like, everybody, owes, anybody that comes to Tahoe or goes to Alaska, anywhere around Valdez, or Skagway, we were on the trip that we found Haynes when we were stuck in, and we were in Skagway for a month. It encompasses what a snowboarder was and is to me. Like, you're finding new stuff. You're using what you have on the shoulders of, of the people that have come before you, and you're going out, seeing the vision, executing in a way that just looks like it should be done. And you're, he's a skateboarder, first and foremost. So the, the, the criteria, you know, he might not have the most gold medals and Olympics and whatever else, but in my eyes, he's the greatest snowboarder of all time, style-wise, and just the stuff that he made before there was any help, you know, doing those things, like how to ride a snowmobile. He taught everybody, all of us, how to ride a snowmobile. Like, and then all of a sudden everybody got snowmobiles, you know. And then you had to learn how to know where to go, how to read a map, how to build a, he built a ramp in his garage so we'd have a place to skate and trucky. Like, he just, like, I emulated so much of my life after what this dude was doing. Um, greatest female, um, for similar reasons, I'm going to have to go with Tara, of course. Um, and that's generational. You know, there's people that have done things, but as far as opening the door for women, the greatest, like, there's a statue of her in 
the state capital of California. It's like, that's, that's weird, you know, but she broke down so many barriers, you know, like, um, so yeah, those are, those are, I think my goats and there's so many, of. I mean, it, there's so many categories, but for me, those are the, if, if you could go heli boarding with three people, who would it be? Oh yeah. Nick Russell. It'd be funny to see him in a helicopter. He'd probably bring a split board in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> he'd be like racing you up the, the helicopter he, you know what he would probably still beat you because you know after you have to wait for all the heli you know, it's like oh, we, we only leave at 8 30 you know you don't get the morning light he'd probably beat you uh nikki would be one uh dave downing would be number two i'd probably want to take eddie he always promised me that that he would go ride AK lines with me, and he, he hasn't yet. So that would be a pretty freaking awesome crew. That'd be a good crew. You could go hellion in the streets of Anchorage with Eddie too. You could get that would be dope. Oh, get, yeah, we double down. <laughs> I just think having his like seeing what he would do when he's dropped off at the top of the peak would be the most. You give throw a mic on him. <laughs> the band. Oh, oh, oh! This is the most awesome thing I've ever. I always love when I think it's Finland where you drive past that wall ride that he did, and it's like there's Eddie's wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every time we drive past it like 10 times in a trip. He was the most stoked person I'd ever met in my life. Just stoked. Okay, we got a couple rapid fires we're going to hit here. Um, run through kind of quick answer style. Toes or heels, what do you got? Toes. Cab or switch front side? Which ones do I got? What Do you do you call it cab or do you call it switch front side? I, switch front side nine, I think. <sighs> Did cab ever do a, a 900? think so you have to do it fake. I, you have I, to do it fakey I, right yeah i say switch back side or switch front side okay beaver slap or no beaver slap in the lift line uh, i slap I don't. he slaps the beaver. I, I have ocd about board on my or snow on my board yeah there's, okay, there's some slapping going on he's an aggressive slapper okay i like that okay buds let's crack some cans <laughs> we're gonna talk to you guys about ah. pub beer now, if you're thinking about going out there and getting absolutely wow. fucking annihilated. Let's do this. Or maybe just having a couple beers. What would you recommend getting, buds? I'd get a pub beer. It's you cheap, would? fun, delicious. Uh, well, that's it's also cheap, fun beer is their, is their motto. Uh, so if you want to support the podcast and also crush a couple it's cans. It's Wednesday. You ain't got nothing to do. Let's pop some cans. There it is. Okay, let's get into it. Welcome to the Pub Beer Crap Shoot. All right, so you have some dice here. Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. And uh, you roll them, we'll tell you what you have to do. If holding this dice, you might have to hit the horn. For Gooner? If, if this is Goon's, uh, I'm guessing this is Goon's outfit here. Oh, yeah. Goon gear. Goon sells dice. Goongear.com. I don't know if that's the website, but... I think that's... It's got to be close to that. Just Google Goon Gear. Buy some shit from them. They're dope. Heavy duty, that dude. Clackety, 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 clack. Ooh, seven. Seven. Okay, eight. seven. I love... This is my favorite question on the list. Who's your favorite pro to party with? I like this one, too. Who's the best at partying? Is that... Like if you're going to end up at a hospital or jail? Or <laughs> All of it. Just you can do a couple different circumstances. Because during your career. Uh, Jimmy Halipoff. That sounds dangerous. Um, never a dull moment. Uh, myself was a pretty... <laughs> <laughs> I was a lot of I was, fun. I was pretty fun to party with. <laughs> I was super fun. No, I did. I, I drank a lot by myself. Uh, no, I, I didn't like the, the bars and partying. I, 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 I would party at home. Um, by yourself? Yeah, I would. It, I wouldn't call it partying. I would just Dancing have a, by yourself over have a couple of mellows. No, but nothing oh. beats, I mean, if you just, the shock value and the whole walking around a trade show or something, Jimmy Hopoff. Uh, Marcus Agee was another, uh, he deserves an air horn, was another guy who uh, had a great exit plan in snowboarding. And he, we would always, you know, talk fly fishing. And it, was, it wasn't a party scene. It was just more of a, like, hang out, drink beer. Those what was his exit? Those are probably my two favorite. His exit was take his tri his Burton travel budget and buy a bass boat with it. And not travel that year? And not travel. <laughs> pro smart, tip. Man. That's a pro tip right there. Pro tip. <laughs> pro He's tips. Like, take well, that budgie, buy a boat. He was able to get it up front? 
Yeah, he got all his travel money up front, and he just went out and bought a bass boat. He built up that trust, built up that trust. Yeah, just give it to me up front. I'll take care of it. I know. Gez- go Gesme just bought a boat. That's a good sign. He's a good, good way to spend the budge. You think he's gonna, that was his travel <laughs> budget, you think? <laughs> he's been nailing lunkers, I see, on the gram. So, well, let's get into it. We've been going for a minute, but we want to know what's next for KJ. What do you got in the hopper? I know you got some cool shit cooking. Uh, well, it's it comes back to that thing. Uh, snowboarding's the gift that keeps on giving. It's this magical thing that we have that is, that is if it's scripted, it becomes no fun, right? Uh, we touched on that. How, what are you going to do? Another video part? You know, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. Seems kind of repetitive. Um, my brain doesn't really work like that. I had to go through some mental things, which were fine. You know, you get through them. You know, that's the thing. Is that as long as there's light at the end of the tunnel, and the light at the end of this tunnel is a freaking awesome light. You know, I get to go snowboarding again, and the splitboarding thing is is so conducive to what I how I think, you know, I need to be into something. It gives me a whole new gear set. It gives me the winter camping element that I've put a lot of time and effort into. And it opens up a way to work with companies again, where I actually have a value. You know, they're not just giving me a chance. It's like, Hey, help me with this split boarding thing. How do we meld that to make it, you know, for lack of a better word, cool. You know, how, how do we not have it be something that the jibbers don't do? Like, how about the jibbers can go out a couple of days a year? How about how about you're a split boarder that I, I still ride the Boreal Park more than I ride anywhere else? It's like, why does it have to be separated? So, um, like when Capita, when me and Blue have been talking for a year, and and you know, how does this look? What's what's it going to look like? What are we gonna? What do we want to do? What's your motive? You know, first and foremost, first question: What's your motivation? Are you are you do you even want to snowboard? It's like, well, hell yeah. But it took me a few years to get there. I didn't want to. I didn't want to tell somebody I was going to do something and, and not be able to to do it, you know. And um, they it, they're willing to make a push on this on this thing and get you know make it more of a quiver. Snowboard is a quiver sport now. It's not that you buy one board. They make boards so good these days. You don't got to run them over with your truck. <laughs> I True. mean, that's pretty. That's that's a huge. You know, <laughs> we've come a long way. Uh, no, so, I mean, I'm going to work with these guys and, and try to just try to make a split board part of the thing. It doesn't have to be a different culture. It can just be part of something that you do. You know, maybe on a storm day, you just get up to the, you get up to the kicker with a split board. I mean, it sure beats snowshoes. It's, you know, get the stigma away from it. It's, it's a really effective way to move around in the backcountry. And yeah, you got to finagle a little bit. And it's not the same as your uh, other board, but it's another way to enjoy snowboarding and enjoy the mountains and stuff you've been staring at your whole life that are outside of the boundaries of the ski resort. It's like the next step, you know. It's, how many times are you going to ride the fingers at KT22? And Well, now you can just get out of your car and walk across the street and, and go do that, you know. And it just works really good with timing, too. Uh, Union Bindings is doing their binding and it's a little cheaper than the rest of the stuff out there so we can make the entry level a little bit easier on people on the pocketbook which is always nice and um, and I I was content just doing it the way I was doing it it's just it that's something I can put 100% of my brain in it it it, it puts the demon at bay you know wake up before sunrise go up get a couple laps and content that that look you're that that feeling you're going for you know when you're when your girl's like dude you you're on a whole different hopefully she doesn't dude you but (laughs) so you're on a whole different level of happiness right now that's part of it calling you dude no she (laughs) doesn't she doesn't dude me (laughs) hey dude um yeah it's a whole different way to enjoy the mountains and and that's part for me is being an all-around snowboarder my whole life is i want to i want to do it all i mean if it was snowblade snowboarding or you know, I would probably be out doing that too. You know, the timing is right because that's where's my body at. You know, being older, like what's what's that look like? How much can you get away with? And you get to put all those pieces together. Do I got to stretch for an hour? Yeah, I got to wake up and do my thing, and that's just part of getting old. It's going to happen to everybody. That that's part of the deal. Do you just stop? No, you just you figure out ways and you put the pieces of the puzzle together and you figure out a way to get that smile on your face. It's healthy, man. Mm-hmm. I think it's cool also, you know, there's that, that separation where you're talking about the, 
there's kind of it, it comes from the schemo mountaineering crunchy space of like you know the original split boarding scene was very mountaineering vibes you know very fucking ponytail micro puff kind of like rei it was very rei right now and, and, yeah. and it's like fucking kevin jones the guy who fucking chuck roast front tens at the x games he's split boarding like oh shit okay like damn i i want to go I, I didn't even know that was a thing you know like, you know i see lane Nack split board you know everybody's split board now so it's, it is cool to see it's a great way to enjoy the mountains and it's so easy to make fun of i mean you have to make fun of it yeah i mean you course. can't not make mm -hmm. fun of it it is crunchy but that said it's also the coolest way to get up to the top of a mountain and get the best power run of your life without paying for a helicopter so when what? someone says i'm just gonna get some snowshoes it's like you don't even know what you're missing. oh dude you're gonna get you're gonna get i did just dude you by the way you're gonna get blown away okay you won't even get invited me. because you'll be so slow you know and yeah. this that, that other form of fitness I, I like that there's a whole different kind of fitness skill set you need as well you need to be able to walk up mountains dude and you need to be, be able to do it safely um i fought it forever until last season and i was just instantly hooked especially with a camera bag yeah. So much easier to get up oh. the mountain. Yeah. Now you need a husky so you can just carry your – that's when you – a husky named Marley. <laughs> that just carries me. Yeah. <laughs> a husky named Marley carries your gear, <laughs> dude. got to be named Marley. I could see a ponytail. Oh, you could do like a, be <laughs> a, a beard, beard tail. tail. Yeah. What is Let's that thing go. even called? I don't know what it's called. A beard tail. <laughs> a beard well, you get some dread, dreads going, little mini dreads. <laughs> some dreads. Yeah, that could be a good look. Yeah, it's just kind of – and I don't know. What, the, what, I, what I see <laughs> – is there's you know it's like longboarding and shortboarding or it's it's all snowboarding you know riding pal like it's it's a tool to get up there what can be bad about it you know it's definitely not going anywhere either mm -mm. and no it's it's not i don't think it's just too awesome it's too awesome yeah and, and then speaking of awesome it's it's like it's the timing is awesome too i've had this history with capita how we um the defenders of the awesome world. How about that segue? Ooh. A great segue. <laughs> yeah, I've done this a few times before, in case you haven't known. <laughs> um, no, it's just that the, the whole story is, is important to me, too, the, that um, Capita was basically the first meeting of that company was in my living room in Mammoth where Jason Brown and uh, Blue and Jeffy Anderson, we all came together and said, hey, we're going to start a brand. But at the time, I'm having Travis Wood at the uh, on the other line uh, tell me he's going to, you know, this contract with, who was with Sim Snowboards at the time, this contract with, you know, a lot of zeros behind it. And then I had, you know, Peter Lyon on the other line saying, I want to start this company with you with Forum. So at that time, it wasn't right for me to be with Capita. You know, I wished him luck. And there, there, was, there was a little, I know, Jason, who ended up at my house after that, you know, that, I got some spray paint on my walls um, that I wasn't on the walls of my ramp that I wasn't too excited about, but I understood it, you know, it was, um, but at that time I, I wasn't ready to take that on, but we, you know, and the time reference between that was probably a month. You know, I, I had this, this, the Capita sticker that looks like the bong, you know, that, that the logo they still use today was on my board. And we, me and Jeffy get together and he'd bring over spray paint and we'd rip it off and it would stencil it. And so it was cool to be part of the beginning of that and to, to have a company like that and, and blue to, to make this company not only exist, but to thrive and to, to be a, a force in supporting some of the best writers to come up in, in between then and now and then to come full circle back to me and say, hey, you have something that's valuable in this world of splitboarding that you're, that you're involved with now. Say, hey, well, I see that could be a way where you could still be involved in snowboarding. So still, you know, Capita's giving back to, to my snowboarding, which is fantastic. A relationship that started, that's that community thing we're talking about. Like this community is very important. So strong. Um, and with Union, I've been with them since the beginning of Union. So that wasn't a really hard push. You know, those guys have always been good to me. And uh, as long as I'm good to myself, you know. And I think that was maybe one of the quotes that that he used, you know. It's great. That's, great. that's cool. You know, we'll be good to you as long as you, you know. And that's a fair deal, right? That's a totally fair deal. Like, we care about you. Take care of yourself and we'll take care of you, right? 
So they, I, I'm really excited about the what we can do here, you know, like, well, and and the chance to. Uh, sorry, I was gonna mean didn't mean to interrupt you, but the the original snowboard of death, right? Yeah, the black snowboard of death. I do have um, a picture of that. Is it actually has my name? It's called the Kevin Jones Capita Black Snowboard of Death. Which when we're discussing pro models, me and Blue and Jeffy, we're sitting there and they're discussing. And Jeffy's was going to be wild, you know, of course, because he was going to have all the spray. You know, he's an artist, so he's he wants art on it. And I was like, I just want a black dude. I just want a black snowboard at the time because I just I'm so over designing graphics and having people morph them. Or you, you design like a pant and they put the zipper like in some different spot that rubs. I was so over designing stuff because it wasn't really you designing it. It was they're putting your name on it and then tweaking it. It's like if, and I'm like, well, just put a skull on the bottom or, you know, and make the top sheet black. So, still and in it's the line still today. around, which <laughs> baffles me. And I kind of, I have to admit, I kind of checked out over the course of the years to make, to see if that board's still on the line, you know. And it's cool. It's full circle, you know. It's just a really good example of how the community of snowboarding gives back on, on so many different, you know. To, for that company to see, like, hey, there's value in Kevin still is, is such a blessing for me to be able to. Because without any sort of – if somebody's just going to give me a paycheck and say, hey, ride this board, and I don't believe in it, I, I've done that. Like, that's not that's – not, I need to be continuing to move forward. And this is a way that I can move forward and actually feel like I'm contributing. You know, what am I going to do? Design another freaking 59? Like, oh, dude, the tail's too soft. Like, really? Like, what are you going to do? Like, you, the boards are kind of the way boards are going to be, I think, at this point. You know, it's kind of like the skateboard. Like, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to make another swallowtail little thing at the... Okay. It's so, cool to see snowboarding taking care of people like that, though. It it's absolutely the community. You know, yeah. they could have they could have picked anybody, but th- this this shoe just fits. It's got the story. It's 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 awesome. A really good example of how we want to see the snowboard act. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they have our, their eyes on us, but this is the, how do you show how do you show how you feel and what you're about? You show by action. You show by doing what you want other people to do. Right? Mm-hmm. How do you teach a kid? You know, you don't. If you don't want them to say the F word, you don't say it around them, right? So I couldn't be any more happy to to be on board with Capita and Union and, and Von Zipper as well. They, they really stepped up and are, are getting on board. Um, and GT, he's been in the – he's been – I rode for Von Zipper before, and then I left and rode for Arnett again. I, I did a, like a full – but then uh, Oakley dropped Arnett. So – and – then I felt bad. I'm like, well, I kind of screwed GT, you know, but I didn't, you know, he understood. And so we had a conversation even before the Capita thing. And he's like, dude, you're, you're a legacy guy to me. You're, you're always be my friend. We always got you back. Kind of a similar, um, vibe. He's like, take care of yourself and do what you do. And, and you, you can be as involved as you want. You're, you're in there, dude. Don't, don't even worry about it. The community will take care of you. Just take care of yourself. And this is this is big on on so many different levels. As much as it's like it's an awesome deal for you personally, but from the history of snowboarding, you know, a lot of a lot of what we've come to realize here sometimes is like what we do occasionally is sometimes we educate some of the listeners and stuff, and and to know where we've not, not this isn't about what we do, but what what you've done, you know, to know where we're going, we have to know where we've been, right? And so it's so easy for a snowboard company to just flavor of the month who's the next new hot shit we need to get this person and then let's just spit out let's just spit out these guys let's spit out you know this person that person let's spit out our legends our our franchise players if you will and you know it's just a big step for snowboarding supporting snowboarders and that's huge because you're this whole show you've been talking about how you know how much respect you have for Salaznik and how snowboarding's been you know on the shoulders of giants and how you have so much respect for the culture of like where it's been before you to where you're at. And then you look at, you know, my generation, I grew up watching you, Luif, you know, the people that like Luif is the best rail rider in the world, in my opinion. And he's, you know, he grew up watching you. He's huge, you know, he's huge. So to, to in order for people to remain legendary in some senses, like the brands play a part in that too. Like the reason, you know, you know, Gooch and, uh, take, for example, Gooch or Jamie Lynn, they're obviously going to be legendary, 
but Vans and 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 Volcom they they elevate that. They they are preserving the culture in some way just by by still giving them a platform, still giving them a paycheck, still saying, "Hey, we're going to take care of you." And so for snowboarding to take care of the people that have earned that kind of uh, what what was the verbiage uh, GT used? He called you uh, a legacy, legacy, legacy a legacy guy. I love that. It's a great term. You know, snowboarding needs to do that. It's not to chew it up, spit it out, get the next kid that's got a lot of likes on Instagram. It's fucking it's bigger than that. It's a bigger it's a bigger movement. So I, I really appreciate uh, what what the brand support and you are doing for snowboarding as a whole. I think it's awesome. I I think it's the direction we need to go in. There's so much marketing from a financial standpoint there's so much money invested in these people right and then you got the there's this knowledge like how much how much wisdom do you want if you're going to go for wisdom in life who do you go to like you go to your grandparents or you go to not not that i'm a grandpa or anything yet i don't think but you know what i mean like you go like go on a wisdom quest like what what's good what's bad get to know these people put them in your put them it's necessary to have those people around and I think that snowboarding kind of lost that for a while. There was there was a span in there where it kind of was built on that. And then, you know, anytime there's, there was that weird money thing between like 98 and 2004-ish that was like the, whoa, you know, people were just getting crazy deals. The, the intro of the crazy deal, like everything had a snowboard. Up. You would go into walmart and it would everything had a snowboard on it or the word extreme you know it was like it was the thing it was on the x it, so it, you know snowboarding's matured and it needs those those people involved and there's room for them that they, they, they have a place in there you know mm-hmm. not just because where i'm at it with my situation right now but the gooch like he's a guy who really got me into splitboarding in 2009 like johan had left a board there yeah the air horn the crap out of that um you want to left a board and he's like you want to go splitboarding i'm like oh let's just hike a line on the pass he's like no okay grab this board like let's go and i'm like okay we i think we did like 28 days in in a, in a month that year like just every i was obsessed it's like every morning and then we went on with our you know our normal filming thing that we were doing but it, it, it was sitting there the seed had been planted that like he's like no you seriously got to try this this is insane like you meditate on the way up, you walk, you just you hang out in the mountains. Like Gucci's all about that. He's like hands on, like hand in the snow, eating it, rubbing it on his face. Like he loves it. Um, so yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think there's snowboarding as a community, which you throw the you throw certain people and certain brands in there, but not everybody can get in. Like it's not you can get in if you want to be in. Just be cool. And that, that kind of has this broader spectrum now of it's a, not at that tight of a circle anymore. It's not, there are people you don't know. There's pros that I don't know now, which wasn't the case, you know, a few years ago. Um, but having, you know, Gooch is, a, is you can't even put a, a word on that, dude. Like, you, watch the hard hungry and the homeless. Like, you, you've almost been there the whole time. Dude. He's been there the longest, maybe like consistently and still so stoked. dude. Yeah. Like his stoke is like freaking palpable. Like it's yeah. So it's, I mean, hooray community of snowboarding. Yeah. Good stuff. Fucking love it. Uh, we got to ask, you know, what's your, what setup do you ride particularly? Cause you're talking about quiver and what's your setup for, you know, resort and maybe split. Resource, I'm usually on a 52 or a 53. Um, I'm usually on the resorts when the snow's not good in the backcountry. Um, for the last few years, that resort's been boreal, and I just love ru- doing park laps on all the all the jibs. Um, the stance, I heard somebody else mention this on here, but my stance uh, definitely changes with pain. Um, it's mostly a little bit more, um, it's duck and it's usually a little bit more in the back than the front. And one day, um, there was, there was a time in, in the nineties where everybody was all about positive, positive, posi posi, if you will. And it's cause the pipe thing kind of was going off and rails were actually uncool for a while. Like people weren't really filming rails except for dogger and, and they're like a select crew. I don't know if you guys remember that, but you're probably too young. Um, it kind of went out of vogue for a little while. 
And then when it came back, obviously it came back like super, like way stronger than it ever been. But um, my stance, I just, I was on my coffee table and I said, how does my body want to land? So well, I'm gonna, I put my board literally on the ground and I jumped off my coffee table. How my feet landed, I took a Sharpie and marked my feet and that was my stance. And it's been the, that way ever since. Because my reasoning was all you're doing is doing this all day long. And that's how your body wants to land. So that's why I have a little bit more. People always trip. They're like, yeah, more duck in the back than in the front. And I go, yeah, I also don't have too many knee surgeries, right? I don't have any yet. I'm going to need one, you know, at some point. But oh, is it luck? Is it, you know, that's that's just how it rolls. But it'll, it'll, it'll kind of morph a little bit depending on, um, if there's a little tweak in there or not. Man. 20, 21 and a half or something. That morphs a little bit too, whether I'm... Edges? Gone. Oh, gonzo. Gonzo. No Park, edges. park board, gone. Uh, Backcountry, uh, split board, the inner edge is gone. Most of the outer edges are gone. Oh, I never thought Does about that. Does that help out when you're shredding it together? Having y- the inner Yeah, edge absolutely. Gone? Especially on, like if you have like a weird hard snow situation, if you keep your... Yeah. You keep your inner edges sharp. It's really catchy, dude. Because oh, you got to imagine, sense. you got to imagine you're doing a turn, and it's like. So if you're in weird snow or anything other than powder, it can get catchy and weird. So I just take those edges off. You notice it when you're billy goat and skinning around, like sliding around more. Or is it not really noticeable? It's noticeable, but it's worth it for me to not when it's critical. I, c- I can fall down on a skin track, and it's not a big deal. But if I if I fall down, say that like the top of a line is like wind scoured and kind of mm-hmm. icy or weird, I don't want to be hanging up right there, or getting some weird mm-hmm. little. So it's like, yeah, you can feel it a little bit on the skin track, but I'll get up the skin track. I don't need to be falling over exposure or something. That's a good pro tip. All yeah. those things are actually like really good actionable advice of how to set up a board. I've never heard of that. Never heard of detune the inside. In the springtime, I notice when you're coming down and it's dark out, it gets hard, super hard, and I'm like can barely ride because of that the inner edge catching. Yeah, you got to take that thing. Yeah, it feels crazy when it's hardened right up. Do you have a specific uh, split board you're going to be riding? Do you know anything about that with Capita? Yeah, I I'm going to be riding one that looks a lot like the one I gave you guys. Where was it? right behind right, you, right, right left. behind me, and then we're going to be developing uh, uh, pretty much a whole new line this year. So we'll, we'll know more about that later but yeah we're going to be putting a lot of resources into this thing and i'm not necessarily putting the resources mine is more like time and energy and focus but um those guys are are doing a really good push so it's it's really exciting you know it's a really exciting part of snowboarding for me so be excited to see how it comes out that's killer man we're stoked for you we are hyped on uh, all the stuff you got going on it's such a incredible journey you just kind of took us through and and uh, before we get out of here, do you want to throw any thank yous out before we wrap this thing up? Um, I want to throw a thank you to my wife. Uh, first and foremost, she's allowing, uh, she's having a, a, a very open mind. She doesn't come from snowboarding. She, she's like, how are you going to, like, you know, we got bills to pay. I'm not afraid to work. I work in the summertime. I'll just continue doing that. She, she, I'll, uh, I got to take all winter last year and kind of tighten up the budget and and give it a good college try. And people took notice that hey, man, if you're going to be if you're going to be out here snowboarding, we want to get you involved, you know. And that was really good for me personally, just in my own head. Like, hey, you still got something to offer, you know, which is probably more in my brain than w- what I'm actually going to do. But either way, just to be involved is a is a blessing, and which is and that's exactly where I want to be, is to be able to help wherever I can whether that's with some kid who's having some weird suicidal thought or whether that's how do I detune my edges on my split board, you know, wh- wherever that, wherever that role is for me to be, it's still kind of morphing and, you know, it's wherever it need does that need to be? Does it redesigning the union's binding and figuring out how that's all going to work out and still keeping it to where most people can afford it? Yeah. That's, that's where I'm at. You know, it's still, still being, that need of feeling useful in a sport that you love and that you put your whole life into. It's, it's amazing. Well, we really appreciate everything you've done for snowboarding. Oh, uh, sorry. Or shit. Sorry. Cut that out. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know you're still going my bad. Oh yeah. I'm still on the thanks. Yeah. Uh, it went to splitboarding. Oh, anyway. Yeah. So yeah, my, my wife or, uh, I mean that, that could go either way with a, with a wife, you know, for all the married people out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
obviously Von Zipper, GT, George, and Union Bindings, um, everybody that's that supported me along the way and helped me and called me out on my BS and um, mom and dad, they've they've always been there and um, yeah, everybody I've shared the chairlift with that those people I was jerks to. I want to thank them for dealing with me. All my kids for understanding over the years that daddy's off doing his thing. He'll be there when he when he can, but when I'm there, I'm going to be all there. So they've been my kids and their families have been everybody's been pretty understanding. You know, there hasn't been really real real big drama there and um which just like the wife thing that that could all go either way, you know. They, people can make your life miserable. Um, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, I want to thank you guys for doing what you're doing, keeping the community um, updated on what's going on out there and bringing the history part into it and and uh, keep doing what you guys do. It's Who would have thought, you know? You guys are kind of the Smithsonian of <laughs> snowboard <laughs> lore right now, you know? It, it, it's important, you know? It's People have put their whole lives in, in hearts, blood, Spit, tears, puke, all over this thing, snowboarding, as you guys all know. It's like it's good to to hear the stories and that people know what what happened out there. What, what's going on in them hills? What are those creepy dudes doing out there in those <laughs> why do they go up the, there every day? In those funny <laughs> reservoir asked, tip beanies. <laughs> I had a roommate ask me that once. What do you what do you guys do up there every day? Why do you keep going up there? <laughs> You're gonna wear a <laughs> groove in the pavement. Yeah, man. And he almost had to ride tin or grab Tindy all year if he didn't come uh, on the bomb hole. He made a little bet with me if he didn't come before the season. Yeah, he's gonna he have, have to grab Tindy. He got to grab Tindy all season. Oh, I might not. That's why been. he drove himself here pretty quick before I, I winter did. kicked in. It's a yeah, bad I, bet. That'll get you here quick. I barely made it. It snowed like ten yeah. inches over the summit, and the, the high. I don't know if I got told you guys the highway was closed the night before. I checked the highway. I'm like, it's closed. I'm like, oh, this is gonna look real bad. Like. The freaking slippery hot dog, like, yeah. <laughs> I think you know. Thank you, snowboarding. I'm not gonna cry. You guys want me to cry? <laughs> <laughs> now it's a special thing. Uh, keep the community strong. Everybody, do what you what you do. Go shred. That's what it's all about. Love it, KJ. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we're all in debt to you and, and appreciate everything you've done for snowboarding. So, uh, and also thank you so much to our listeners for each and every week tuning in. And, um, I love how you're just hammering on making the community stronger. We just got to keep building the snowboard community coming together and, uh, we'll see you next week over and out from the bomb hole. <laughs>